Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories. I am your host for today, John DeLynn, and I'm joined uh, today by the wonderful Jen Camp. Hey, Jen. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, you're so welcome. This is an important topic today. Yeah, I am very excited for this Mormon story. Yeah. Today, uh, we are going to be talking about kind of a bit of a serious topic, but one that I think is really prevalent probably in the human condition, but I would also say very prevalent within Mormonism. We are going to be talking about growing up in a narcissistic Mormon family system. And it's a sensitive uh, issue. Um, those of you who have been following Mormon stories for a while will know that I, I did get um, a degree in um, clinical counseling psychology. I don't say that to brag or to flex, but only just to acknowledge that I've studied some of this a little bit. I'm, no, I'm in no way an expert on personality disorders, which narcissism kind of qualifies for. But I, I know just enough to uh, know that we have to be careful. Um, and so uh, before we kind of announce today's guests and bring them on, I'm going to just provide a few little disclaimers and then I'll allow our, our guests to add their own disclaimers. But um, so my understanding of kind of the DSM or the Diagnostic Statistics Manual within the field of mental health is that there's kind of standard diagnoses like, you know, depression or anxiety, um, trauma, those sorts of things. Uh, back in the old DSM, those were called Axis One diagnoses, and then, and they got rid of the those t classifications with the new DSM. But there's a whole another class of diagnoses that are often referred to as personality disorders, and um, unlike unlike traditional um, mental health disorders like anxiety and depression, personality disorders are tricky because they're kind of just the personality that the person develops by the time they're an adult and they're not, you know, they're, they're difficult, very, very difficult to treat. They're very resistant to treatment, although there are treatments, but if you, if you, uh, if you don't know anything about what I'm talking about, some of the <coughs> classic personality disorders are things like borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, those are those are three of the ones. There's also an OCD personality disorder, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which is different from OCD. We could we could there's schizotypal. There, we could go into lots of different types of personality disorders. But the point is, um, I wanted to start with the disclaimer saying that one of the tricky things about talking about um, personality disorders is they're overused in common vernacular. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, I have a friend who's a psychiatrist who said to me the other day, just just about the narcissistic personality disorder classification, he made the joke that like everyone's ex-spouse ever, is, you know, has been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. And that's not to invalidate real instances of that. But, um, you know, just like calling people who are very meticulous OCD um, you know, using the term narcissism loosely is not, you know, generally a very helpful thing. Um, and so I want to provide that uh, diagnosis. Uh, uh, sorry, that disclaimer. I also want to provide another disclaimer, which is that, you know, we will be talking about these sorts of features and um, sort of a, a narcissistic family system. In no way are we implying that I or even our guests necessarily have obtained a formal diagnosis. So whenever you do talk about mental health diagnoses, you want to be careful not to be casual about that because you really don't know whether someone meets criteria for a, a personality disorder or any diagnosis until they've sat with a licensed mental health professional who goes through the criteria and, um, and makes the diagnosis. And so, so that's not what we're going to be talking about here. Um, we're going to be talking about our guests' perceptions around what they have identified to be what they think is traits of an individual or individuals and or a system. And I just wanted to provide that disclaimer. And then the final disclaimer I want to offer is that whenever we can, we want to try and be tougher on systems than we are on individuals. And what's 
What's difficult is when we talk about a narcissistic family system, there's usually one family member that um, meets w- would meet the criteria for something like narcissism. And then there's an enabler and then a family system that evolves around that. Having said that, our goal today is not to throw anyone under the bus um, per se. And so all of that, it, it, and instead to talk about how family systems, particularly within high demand religions like Mormonism, can be particularly problematic. And, and so it's difficult, but, but all we can do is say with our intentions, it's not to sort of diagnose anyone or to blame anyone or to shame anyone. And at the same time, if we don't talk about this type of stuff, we don't learn, people don't feel validated, um, and we don't learn lessons that then we can use to make sure that we don't, um, we don't behave in certain ways or that we don't create family systems that kind of perpetuate the, the harm across multiple generations. And for all those reasons, we're trying to kind of navigate a difficult topic. I'll also say that we're going to be talking about death by suicide today, at least one instance of that. And so we always want to provide that sort of disclaimer as well. Um, and that's a lot. That's a, that's, you know, that's a really long disclaimer, huh, Jen? Yeah. Yeah, it is. But it's important. <laughs> I think it is. Yeah. yeah. So those are all the disclaimers that I thought. Uh, and we're not going to be, we're not going to be using the names of the people that we're talking about within the family system as best as we can, other than the first names of our guests. So that's a, that's also an extra attempt to just protect the, you know, to the extent that we can um, protect the privacy and to not like cause unnecessary harm to the people involved. So that's my disclaimer. Um, And without any further ado, um, Ari and Adam, welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. Wow. Thank you. (laughs) No, that was exactly what needed to be said. Um, because like you said, I'm not, I'm not a professional in diagnosing and I'm not diagnosing anybody. I, it was really a conclusion that I was reluctant to come to. And, um, and I'm not here to speak badly about anybody. Um, I'm just here to, uh, I guess, hopefully be a parachute to maybe somebody who, might be in free fall like I was. And I just want to help. I don't want to hurt anybody. And so that's why I'm leaving out my last name and I'm not naming um, the family members involved um, because I needed several parachutes to save me. And I just want to be one of those for somebody else. Beautiful. Um, Thank you, Ari. And we feel that, and I've sensed that intent, and that's why we're wanting to do this and and feel strongly about it. Um, And this is going to be an emotional one. Mm -hmm. Right, Jen? (laughs) Yeah. Jen's Jen's already starting to feel it, too. No one will ever cry on Mormon stories (laughs) without me. (laughs) I will always be right there with them. (laughs) And I'm not a crier. I've never really been a crier, so I I have to just kind of, like, be at peace with that. But... um, but I love it. I, I believe it's important to like people apologize for sharing their emotions. And I never want that. I love, I love it when people are able to be vulnerable and authentic and mm-hmm. show their emotions, even though I'm not a crier. It's okay. You don't have to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Your eyes make it dry, but it's okay. Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So um, a little bit about how it's going to be structured. So today we're going to be talking about Ari and Ari's family of origin. Yeah. And um, that's going to be the primary focus. And the title is growing up like like we maybe began with growing up in a narcissistic Mormon family system mm-hmm. uh, with Ari. We we've we've already decided to bring her husband on Adam, not because we're going to be also digging in deep with Adam's story per se, although we also like to provide the disclaimer that Adam has a story that's equally worthy of being told. But because we want to keep the focus on the main topic at hand, the main role for Adam, as I understand it, is going to be 
kind of providing support to Ari's story for today. But we mean no disrespect by that. Is that okay? Um, no, no, yeah, I'm here to support her and what she went through and what my perspective is or what I've seen her go through. So. And uh, he's very eye catching. He's hot. <laughs> he's hot. Is that so. just a, <laughs> no. he's eye candy? So is yeah. He your trophy <laughs> husband. The, okay, just the yes, the, the the words that come through my head a lot is whatever takes the focus off her face, <laughs> whatever <laughs> takes the focus off her. <laughs> so. mm. <laughs> Anyway. All right. Well, you know, it, it, it's nice to be eye candy, you know. Well, I, I guess. And he, he has a lot. He like not just I'm not. people describe Adam as a quiet strength. And when he, more than several people have said that when Adam talks, you listen. And so he does, he's a man of very few words, but when he talks, it's important. So so when he speak, I mean, not to put any like pressure on when he uh-huh. says that he must say, but he just, he does. He chooses his words very carefully and okay. he says them. I'm very good about that. Well, welcome Adam and, and welcome Ari. Okay. Well, um, Ari, maybe if it's all right, let's just dive in where, well, if there's any other setup you want to provide, no, you're good. Oh, okay. It's, where does your, sorry. where does your Mormon story begin? Oh, goodness. Um, well, that's a hard part because I, I, it began, I am a, I, I was born under the covenant, you know, um, You're in Utah. I, w- I was born in Utah. Um, but we quickly moved to, well, yeah. Um, what, what those in understand is the mission field. Um, we, we, um, moved to another state. And so I spent the first 11 years of my life in the mission field. Um, which those of you who don't know what that is, it's just not Utah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, it's, what, it's what Mormons call everywhere yeah, outside of Utah. Yeah, <laughs> it's just not Utah. Yeah. And so, um, and I grew up, you know, I, I am the third child of several, lots, I mean, lots of children. And, um, you know, I had a, I would say a pretty normal 1980s 1990s childhood in mormon mormon world you know and um you know i i don't have a lot to particularly add i mean my we had calling you know, my parents had high callings um and stuff and we were just kind of the we went to church we always went to church um and you know i i remember one one time not wanting to go to church. I, I never fought to go to church. Um, I remember it was a fast Sunday. This is a kind of a funny story, but it was a fast Sunday. And I didn't want to go to church. I faked sick, but I was so indoctrinated, even at probably eight years old, seven or eight years old, that I still fasted. <laughs> I was home alone, and I still fasted. It was a fast Sunday? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was a child, but okay, but I will say that I ate a chocolate chip. I remember, like, <laughs> I ate a chocolate chip. And so that was how, like, I did, I was very, very, um, you, you did what you were told. And um, and it was not it was a bad thing. It just, that's how it was. Um, and I, you know, we just kind of, I that's, and we moved to Utah when I was about 11. They're traditional kind of Mormon behaviors that Mormon families are supposed to do. Usually, let's just see, the father works outside the home and he's the primary breadwinner. The mom is usually a stay-at-home mom. Yeah. And uh, was that the case in, in your family uh-huh. of origin? Yes, it was. My dad, yeah, he did. Um, it was different. I mean, my mom, we, we didn't have a lot of money. Um, my dad, he worked as a car stereo salesman for the first little bit. And he went to school. He went back to school when I was younger. And so my mom, she ran an in-home daycare. And so she, while she was home, she still worked. And so we had that kind of a thing. But yeah, it was very much, and that was always the goal, that my, my mom would be home with us and my dad would, would be the breadwinner. Okay. Yeah. And then there's the typical kind of markers that at least Mormons try and live up to, which is like, daily scripture study, daily family prayer, you know, regular church attendance, mm-hmm. 
no coffee, no tea, you know, um, no swearing, uh, you know, how did, how did your family match up to all that? All of that. Okay. Like we didn't, I mean, we had always had family prayer. We, um, had no, no coffee. My dad did like Mountain Dew. (laughs) He did like Mountain Dew and he still does. Um, but as far as I know, the last I heard, but, um, and he, yeah, we didn't, and we didn't swear. We even had family swear words. Like, so my mom operated on the premise of even if things like shut up and dumb and butt and fart, <laughs> even if those words were bad, like those words were our personal family swear words. And so we, it was making it so that if we couldn't even say those words, we would never say the other words. So we had our own words. What were they? You don't They're want to so say silly. <laughs> okay. No, that's even more the reason to say them. I can't. Okay. I can't. It's so embarrassing. Okay. Okay. No. Like Mormons say fetch and frick oh. and. No, I just can't. <laughs> it's okay. It brings up a lot. Those words. I just. It's I, it was one thing. I just was like, no. That's what the word is. And because I didn't want my kids to go out in public like I did and call poop something so strange. And your kids look at you like, what are you saying? I'm like, that's poop. That is poop. <laughs> and you're going to call it what it is. <laughs> my family called urine tinkle. So yeah. that's an example. I don't know if that's yeah. an example. Of like- kind of. But OK, it's a funny <laughs> story. But I just it's a funny story that I don't want to cast a shadow over. OK, so I guess from what I understand, my older brother you know, when, oh gosh, when he was little, he just went to the bathroom and looked in there and he said, ew, yuck. And so that's what poop was called, was ew, yuck. It's fine. But I really, like, in my mind, I spelled it like a full word. Like, I really thought it was a word. E-E-W. Like, I thought it was one word. I never looked at it as like, ew, yuck. It was ew, yuck. <laughs> so, but it's a funny, cute story, but that kept us to say. No, you can take good. that out if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Um, okay, so let's see. Is there anything about your life prior to, let's just say, your adolescent years, your family life that you want to maybe mention? Um, no, I mean, it was, it was just what it was. My world was very small, and that's... Um, what it was. I mean, I wouldn't say that I had, I mean, I had, when you grow up the way you grow up, it's the way you grow up. I don't know if that makes sense. Like I didn't see anything odd. It was just, I was, it was just the way it was. And it was, it wasn't like we lived a perfect family system. It was just that we, like, it was the family system. And and so I, I didn't notice that my family was particularly different until I got a little bit older. Okay, so as far as you were concerned, up through your adolescence, you're just growing up in a normal family. Yeah, I, I, I didn't. I mean, I knew growing outside of Utah, I knew growing up outside of Utah, I was, and I, have, I guess I haven't talked about this, is I... I was one of very few Mormons, actually, and so I, I lived. I was taught to live my religion as an example to others, being in the mission field. So I was the only. No, maybe there was another. There was another boy who was in my ward. He was in my elementary school class, but um, I mean, I grew up in, I, in a melting pot. I mean, I had you know. African American classmates. I had people from all walks of life and religions, and there was a boy across the street who was Jewish. And I honestly, I actually grew up celebrating differences, which is kind of strange, with the caveat actually that they would eventually become Mormon because, you know, that's kind of the way it was. We were, we were the chosen. You know, they knew they had some information, but not all the information. You were the chosen what? Um, we were the chosen church. We were the, the chosen God's chosen yeah, people. Kinda? God's chosen people. We we had all the answers. They didn't, and um, and so in a way, even though I grew up with differences, 
I just looked at them in, in a sad way, I guess. Like, I remember having yeah. a conversation with my friend across the street. Um, his name was Adam. Um, not that, anyway, different Adam, but he, um, he was, we were downstairs and it was so interesting because I actually, I grew up, you know, I don't know if you grew up in the eighties when people asked, do you believe in dinosaurs? Like <laughs> it was, the question was, do you believe in dinosaurs? And I remember asking him, do you believe in dinosaurs? And, and he was like, yes, there are dinosaurs. But I grew up in that, a very like, they, there was no way to explain dinosaurs. So they were, did not <laughs> exist. And just, um, but I remember the conversation I had with him because I knew he was Jewish. And I asked him, I said, do you believe your church is the true church? And he said, yes. But I still felt so sad for him. I'm like, oh my gosh, how do you not know? You're going to know one day. <laughs> you know? But I remember that conversation where I was and, yeah. and I still felt sorry for all of these people, even though I, it was just a weird dichotomy. Sure growing up that way. Okay. Well, what I, what I pulled up, I went to psychology today and I pulled up an article called the 12 rules of a dysfunctional narcissistic family. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would read them sure. just as a way to kind of help the audience start thinking about whether they've experienced a family like this, but also to kind of introduce some of the concepts that I'm guessing mm -hmm. we're going to be dealing with today. Sure, and, and then as they fine. as they come up, we can kind of go, oh yeah, that's the thing we mentioned. Yeah. Price. What do you think about that? I think that's great. My my realization of narcissism kind of came as I recently now, but it didn't manifest itself probably until after until we were engaged. So that's kind of the timeline there. Okay. So yeah, you can introduce it so people know to listen for. Okay. To listen for it. That's yeah, I'll just read them. And there's there's quite a bit, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna go ahead and take the time to read it because there's a bit of an educational function that yeah. I want today's episode mm -hmm. to kind of cover. So um, number one is acceptance is conditional. So it's kind of like I don't know conditional love maybe mm -hmm. um, complying with the family narrative and the value system is the way you get love. Submission is required, so you got to submit to the dominant person's, narcissistic person's authority. Someone's got to be blamed for problems. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous to be vulnerable. Um, you got to take sides if there's sides. There's never enough love and respect to go around. <laughs> Jen's naughty. Um, feelings are wrong. Mm -hmm. um, competition, not cooperation, rules the day. It's very competitive. Appearances are more important than substance. Rage is normalized. Mm -hmm. Denial is rampant. And there is no safety. Yeah. So. All of those things. Did, did that, you were also, not, you were also nodding your head. Yes. <laughs> okay. All of those things, yeah. Okay. So I thought I'd introduce those concepts. Um, maybe people in the audience, some maybe listeners or viewers in the audience are also nodding their heads. I didn't grow up in a narcissistic family. So like, I mean, the tricky thing about this is there's always going to be mm -hmm. some conditional love in a family right. and there's always going to be parents wanting some obedience and, you know, sometimes it's going to feel emotionally. So, I mean, it's tricky yeah. because we're all going to identify some of these elements to some degree in our family, mm -hmm. but those are the criteria that psychology today lists. Right. So having said that, um, is there any is there any jumping off point you want to kind of start with now that I've read those? Or do you want to just keep going with your Mormon story? Because there's kind of the typical adolescent stuff. That yeah, can... so no, the, I would like to, yeah, that's, so yeah, my, all of, all of that was, and so yeah, jumping ahead, I think I a good starting point would be my, our, our engagement. Okay, so you did the, did you do the seminary thing, early morning I, seminary? I, no, we, I, we, we were in Utah by the time I started seminary, so it was part of the, part of the schedule. So it was release time seminary. Yeah. In, yeah. in a Utah high school. Yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And do you want to say anything about just your high school years, you know, your faith, your experiences? Um, my high school years were fine. Like, were you pretty orthodox as a, as a I, teen? I or was. Were you rebellious I mean, here's or? the thing like, I was. I, I was very, I was a believer. I was a believer. Um, and, but I, I was a normal, I was a typical 
kid. I was typical, you know, I, I even, you know, my parents, it was, the rules seemed to always change based on, you know, what parents they need, wanted to, to show, but I, I wore sleeveless things. I did, you know, and I... Were you athletic? I was, so I... Was yeah, that part of it, like runner kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, I, I ran, yeah, I ran um, in, in high school, and I, I ran um, track and cross country there, and... Um, and then I, yeah, it was, it was pretty typical, but yeah, we, there were some things, you know, where it was very controlling. It was very controlling, you know, just my mom would say, don't hold hands with boys because, um, next step was a kiss. Like we couldn't, like, it was just very purity culture was very dominant. Um, so what were the rules and, or the expectations regarding clothing for you? It was so blurred for me um, because I was allowed to wear sleeveless things and shorts and things like that. But then I would, it just, just little thing. I mean, it, that wasn't, that was actually not even a problem. It was just more having a boyfriend and, you know, she would always jump to conclusions that I was doing things that I wasn't, you know, and it was just a very hostile environment when I would have a boyfriend. Yeah. And it just controlling a lot of controlling. I remember as a Mormon parent, yeah. even as a progressive or even non-believing Mormon mm -hmm. parent, having been raised with a lot of chastity and kind of a abstinence mentality, being super afraid for my daughters specifically for some weird reason about them dating boys. So, I mean, I, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's how it was, and I feel bad. He's just quiet over here. He probably has a lot more to add. Did you guys date in high school? Don't. No, we didn't. We dated no, we did in, not. we, we okay. met right after hmm. high school, okay. right after my high school. But no, it was really just, yeah, the law of chastity and, and also the whole don't, my, my dad would, my dad would say things about belly buttons and things and, and not showing too much, you know, because here he was a, a he, he was a, a, therapist, a social worker, and he worked with a lot of people in the prison systems and stuff. And I remember him saying that he had a client who was, he liked belly buttons and I needed a cover. Like he used a lot of fear, like that we needed to be covered so that we could control the minds of, so men wouldn't act. That was a lot, what I was told, just a lot of fear. And so I remember walking around like, oh, I got to cover this because some man's going to see me and he's going to rape me because he sees my belly button. Mm -hmm. I really do. I remember do, being scared to walk in public. And okay. That, yeah. Any other family stories in high school that would help illustrate the narcissistic, the, the narcissistic family system? Yeah, well, or? really just that... As I started to grow up, like when I was little, we were a family, like an extended family. I had aunts and I had uncles and, and I had a happy extended family. And as the years went on, we suddenly they were gone. Like we couldn't talk to them anymore. Like that's, that was pretty like, one day we're with this aunt. No, we don't talk to her anymore. We don't talk to that aunt anymore. Or, or this person. And it was constant. It was very gossipy and talking bad about people. And I grew up um, not, like, <laughs> being able to feel safe around certain people. And um, my mom was very gossipy about people in the ward. And that is also a characteristic of narcissistic narcissists. And, and I... And so I would, I saw the world through her lens. If she didn't like somebody, I couldn't like that person. If that person was out, you know, but then the rules would always change. Oh, now she didn't like that person. Now, now she likes that person. And it was really all dependent on her worldview. And so, and, and that was more of the, how I grew up was we are good and they're bad. And look how bad they are. Look how they raise their children. Look how they, and it was always reinforced that our family was the best family. And so that, that was something that was really hard because I would go to family gatherings and, 
And I didn't feel like I could talk to anybody because I was like, I know what you've done. I know what kind of a person. I know you hurt my mom's feelings. And and same thing in the ward. It was just constant gossip and constant. My, a narcissist, as I have come to understand, is always a victim and a hero. And my mom was always the victim and the hero. Somebody was always hurting her feelings. And, and we were always taught and told to gather around her. And it, that was the constant. If I can, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So you graduate from high school. Um, and what happens next? So I, I graduated and I, I got a scholarship to run at a university, a D1 school and Division and one. Divi- yeah. That's a big deal. Thank you. Yeah, Margie, Margie <laughs> ran for a D1 school. Yeah, I, and and so, and, and I, and then, um, but that first year, this guy came along. So <laughs> that was, you know, so we met my freshman year in, in college, and he was, as it, he was a super senior. He was there for one, one extra year. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, Adam, do you want to just say briefly, Anything about your background, just kind of, just so we, you know, kind of. Um, no, I, I mean, I grew up in Utah, typical Mormon family, but we weren't super uh, by the book. It was just, my dad worked on Sundays a lot. My mom didn't want to go without my dad, so we didn't, we went, but we were, we were never inactive. But it was just, yeah, I grew up here in Utah along the, you know, in Davis County and basic Mormon family, I guess. I mean, nothing, you know. Not super orthodox, <laughs> no, but not we were, totally out either. Yeah, you, we, we'd be considered the Jack Mormon family, you know, not the Molly Mormon. That's what we called them here in Davis County. So that's what I would be. And do Jack Mormons still attend church? <laughs> I guess. I don't know. We did, but kind of. So. Okay. But, okay. Yeah. Um, so nothing really stand out or noteworthy about your story as it kind of feeds into Ari's just... To the no growing you didn't, up, you didn't serve. Did you do seminary? Did you serve a mission? Um, I was actually, I, I almost got kicked out of seminary because I didn't go. So, okay, <laughs> um, weren't into I, seminary. What's that? You weren't into seminary. No, I mean, I, I went, but it was too early, and then I just stopped going. <laughs> okay, um, but I didn't serve a mission. No, I had I had a scholarship to run track. Oh, you were a runner too. Yeah, I, okay. I couldn't, I it was just a weird situation. I, it was either go on a mission, lose my scholarship, or get my scholarship in. And that so I, I chose my scholarship. I, I just there was a, a a a credit that I missed and I had to go that year. I had to go um, and get my scholarship. Basically, is what it was. So I went and 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 then um, throughout college, yeah, I I didn't. I just decided not to go after that. Um, so was it a faith thing? Did you not believe it particularly, or just you weren't kind of into it? Um, well. Uh, I, looking back, it was a little bit of both. I don't, you know, is I just went along with what I was taught. I was just, you know, um, I never thought I wouldn't believe it. I always thought it was just my mom would always say, if there was things we didn't like or it was like weird, she would always just say, well, it does good thing. It was, you know, the feelings I get there and that kind of thing. Um, so I always went back to that you know, the good things that were, were taught. And, the, you know, I always go back to that if I any had any doubt um, about it. So, um, you know, I mean, going through through college, I I, uh, I was always uh, not going to mission hurt me with uh, the dating scene, even in Utah. Just I had many uh, girls just say, I can't date you anymore because you didn't serve a mission. But that's where, if it feeds into her story a little <laughs> that way. So, okay. um, yeah. Um, what what event? Were you I was eight hundred. You were an eight hundred. Yeah, that's a hard event. That's we're we both, both we both were. <laughs> you both did the eight hundred. Yeah. yeah, was that your main event? Uh-huh. I hear the yeah. the eight hundred is really hard it in does. terms of like how painful it is to run it. The eight hundred yeah. and four hundred meter hurdles are the worst as yeah. far as pain goes. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, that's what we hear, but that's all we know. Uh huh. Well, Except for we were sprinters, but. but we've we've run almost everything from the one hundred to the marathon. Yeah. So we can yeah. kind of. Yeah, we can kind of. Yeah, we've run it actually. You're right. In yeah. high school, they use you for lots of different events. Yeah, yeah. in high but, school, we were both sprinters in high school. 
And when you get to the college, you have to be really fast. They, and they kind of move yeah. you to the middle distance if you're not yeah. super. Yeah, right. and we did cross country. So. Stuff. Do you want to say where you went to college or do you not want to say where you went to college? I'd rather not. Okay, that's, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> yep, good. Boundaries yeah. are good. Okay, <laughs> so you guys met. Is that the next part of the story? Yeah, we met. You're a freshman? I was a freshman, and so I'm a young freshman, too. Some, so, like 18 or 17? Like I was, our first date, I was like 10 days 18. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, but he didn't know that. I mean, he just saw an incoming freshman. I mean, wait a second. I'm not speaking for you. He wasn't going after freshmen. <laughs> that I know. Well, of. and I had a rule. I wasn't going to that first yeah. year. Yeah. I, or that last year. I was, I, I, made, I wasn't going to date. I was just going to run track and, and graduate and go on my way. Because I've, I've, yeah, fresh. I, I didn't want, there was a, I just didn't want to date a freshman. But she was cute enough that I really wanted to ask her out. So. <laughs> so. So. And I didn't know she was 18 that week. She told me on the, our date that she just turned 18, and I thought, this isn't going to go anywhere because she just turned 18. Yeah. So. And I wasn't looking to get married either. I had just graduated from, I mean, this was like, I was now ready. I was starting to just become myself, you know, outside of the context of my family. Um, that, was, that's, that was my catapult. And then so, but I met him, and, and we just kind of, we started dating and and the thing is like it was the second probably the second date I think at least if not the first date where he told me he didn't serve a mission mm -hmm. so it wasn't I mean I think he probably wanted to I mean get it out of the way like hey this full disclosure I didn't serve a mission and what did that mean to you when you first heard it as a someone raised orthodox mom um I honestly like I well, how were you taught to view it? I was taught you had to serve a mission, like, and you had to marry a virgin missionary. But I guess I didn't care. Like, I don't know. Like, it was just something in me. I was like, I didn't care. It didn't bother me. It wasn't a deal breaker for me. And I, we were just, you know, that this just wasn't. I just don't remember it being a deal breaker for me. But I, I was taught otherwise. Okay. So... So for you, it wasn't like a, no. a mandatory checklist item. It wasn't. And here, I, I dated a non-member in high school. Oh. I did. And and I guess maybe that was the, my parents never, and that's the thing, when I dated that non-member, it was always, the goal was to get him to be baptized and serve a mission. They were okay with me dating him because that, that was the eventual if I was going to marry him. It's a form of missionary work. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And, and he didn't want to, you know, and, and so the relationship kind of ended a little bit on those terms. But I think there was a little bit of a disconnect with me because when I started dating him, I was like, well, at least he's a member, <laughs> you know? So it didn't, it didn't bother me because I was, you know, and, and yeah, and to be honest, the, the non-member that I dated was actually... He was a lot better his, in terms of, he didn't push me to do, you know. Bad things. Bad things. He was a, <laughs> quotes, <bad> things. <laughs> he was actually very, <laughs> uh, very good. So, okay. Anyway, yeah. Okay. So, um, where does, the, where do things start getting tense? Mm -hmm. uh, had you been taught, had you gone into college with some sort of like timeline for when you would potentially get engaged or married? To him or in general? In general. No. Okay. Like, I wasn't looking to get married soon. Like, that just wasn't on my radar. You act like that's some weird thing, but that's, like, <laughs> very common in Utah, yeah. isn't it? I, I had goals. I wanted to run. I was in college to run. Okay. Like, I didn't care. I didn't even know what I was going to study in college, like, to be completely honest. Like, I'm like, I'm here to run. This is, like, I wasn't, I had unfinished business. So that's where I, that's why I was there. Okay. And so, but things kind of got like, when they got, when things got serious between the two of us, that's when things went bad between, with my relationship with my parents. Um, because now it was, oh, she really, she is going to marry this guy who didn't serve a mission. And... And so in that, it just, it went bad fast. 
it just went that fast. Let me ask a clarifying question. So, uh, you know, when you talked about like your upbringing, mm -hmm. you're not telling a bunch of horror stories. You're basically saying, you know, my, you know, there was a concern about modesty and a lot of chastity stuff that both your mom and dad had it. And I think that could be almost every Mormon family I've ever interviewed. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you talked a bit about losing some family relations and kind of like mm -hmm. gossip. But again, someone could say that's every Mormon yeah. family ever. So I'm, you know, I'm wondering if like a, if an alien was like observing your family through your marriage, through the, the engagement in the marriage, if they would look at it and say, whoa, what an awful, horrible, horrific family, or... Is it more that you just were used to a really toxic, unhealthy environment? And so when you talk about it, it's just like, yeah, it was just, you know, because the way you're describing it so far, yeah. and this isn't me doubting you, it's just a clarifying question. The way you're describing it up until the engagement, right. it sounded like just kind of, I, I don't want to say every Mormon family ever, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the question because it's hard to talk about the bad things that happen. Like, I don't like to. And I skip over those parts. I don't know, like, we were, like, but we weren't. And that's so hard. Because, like, I don't want to jump back into my timeline, but... There was abuse in my family. And, and it, it's hard. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, my parents fought a lot. At parents fight, okay. Um, my, my mom was physically abusive to us. And she called us names. I never knew when she was going to rage. I walked on eggshells, you know. I, um, I just tried so hard not to get on her bad side. Um, and but that was normal life for me. If you, um, I, our sibling, we were pitted against each other. We did not form bonds with each other. My older brother and I are 15 months apart. He was told bad things about me. I was told bad things about him. We did not form bonds. You know, it's it's all in this, and I guess I'm just... I'm shutting it out and I'm trying not to. You know, I, and this is other people's stories too. You know, walking in on my mom holding my brother up and hitting him. And just living in fear. And she, <laughs> and trying to rescue my little brothers. And, but always thinking it was me and I was, I was a bad girl and I just needed to be better. And trying so hard to be good and earn favor with her so I wouldn't be the next one. And then uh, trying to talk to my dad trying to tell him what was happening. And then him always just saying that I, I needed to be better. And that she was maybe just having a hard day, but she was good and look at the good things she was doing for us or that she was, that she would always stop him at the door before he got home and tell him how bad we were before we got, before he could, we could even tell him. And 
we were, you know, she, she was very hard. And we just, I, we, the narrative was told about us to him, and we were rendered voiceless. So, I don't know what to say. It just was hard. It was a typical Mormon upbringing with a lot of heart. And I don't know what other... That was my upbringing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. No, you, no. you asked for it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'm so sorry. And, like, on the one hand, I don't want to pry. Um and, and we don't want to hurt anyone or shame anyone. On the other hand, if we don't, I guess if we don't talk about some of these things, you have we don't really thing. connect with yeah. what we're talking about or help educate. Yeah. If it's okay, really quick. And thank you for being so vulnerable. And I'm sorry this is so no, hard. It's so, I'm here. That's why I'm here. But yeah. I just need to figure yeah. out how to do it. <laughs> yeah. No, that was that was powerful. The fact that, it, that you waited so long to share some of that stuff shows you, I think, to me, you're really trying hard to be kind, mm -hmm. as kind as you can. Yeah. Because I I'm agree. not a perfect mom either. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And so you're saying it really started to become pronounced for you. I mean, it sounds like it was pronounced all along, mm -hmm. but the way you kind of described it at the beginning, rubber really started to meet the road when you guys started talking about yeah. engagement. Right. How do you want to start up? Pick it, pick so up So that was just... It was, I can't remember when it was communicated to me that I wasn't, that he wasn't good enough, but it just was. And then suddenly it was just that I, I was, it was not condoned. I mean, that's the wrong word. It was not allowed. <laughs> it was not allowed. I couldn't, I could not marry him in because of covenants that were made in the temple, that my, my, my mom made in the temple, um, particularly the law of consecration. You give your time, talents, and all of those things, and she could not, it, it was against everything that she had covenanted to, to allow her daughter to marry a man who didn't, didn't devote his time, talents, and all of those things. She could not do it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like a like a breaking point. It's just like this is too much. Like she just had you wouldn't had, allow it. Had you had older siblings that had married outside the covenant? No, no, no. I my older sister and I got married the same year. Okay. And no, we were the first two to get married, and I had a brother on a mission at the time, and but it was just absolutely. I just could not. And it was just, it was just this control, control, control. And, and um, you know, he even, if you want to talk, he went and asked for my hand in marriage, which did you not. you want to tell that story? Would you Adam? like to tell that story? I was <laughs> story. so, it was pre-cell phone, and I remember just, where is he? He's not coming back. Um, <laughs> I thought they killed him or something. We went to his, uh, her, her father's office with. Uh, wait, wait, I'm going to pause you. Sorry. Before you tell this story, did you feel disapproval beforehand? I knew that, yeah. yeah. You want to talk about that, that how you experienced the disapproval um, before we talk? Yeah. I didn't uh, mean to interrupt, no. but I just wanted to give, <laughs> give you a chance to give a little background. Yeah. No, uh, well, that year, yeah, I thought uh, um, when I first met her family, they were really friendly, really nice. Um, I could sense there was that conventional Mormon family, and I, th I just remember thinking it was weird if I can go back to my you know, college brain there that it was a little odd. And, but I, I, but I found it also kind of engaging. They were very nice. She had little brothers running around. Um, their family was really nice. Her dad was really super nice. Um, and as we started to date and progress throughout the dating, I didn't get any pushback. Um, I felt accepted. Um, I felt brought in. They invited me over for Sunday dinners as we dated throughout the year. Um, so it was very inviting. Um, once we started to kind of go into talking about marriage, there was a little bit of hesitation, a little bit of, I could feel a pushback in her conversations that we had um, just from her family. Um, and then when I, yeah, I went to ask, 
her dad. Um, it was on their terms. It had to be, it was scheduled at his office with him and uh, her mom. Um, and it was a, I think I was in there for three or four hours. Oh. Um, and it was just a grueling back and forth of, and they were f- wanting me to go on a mission. It was, you need to go on a mission. And it was just a constant back. I can, it's kind of an out of body of experience. It was just, um, so you're long, at what age at this point? You're I'm like, 23. You're 23. And, and I, my thing was, I'm already 23. I'm, I've got, I've got a career right after college. I know what I'm going into. What was that going to be? Um, I was going to the police corps. I was already accepted. Um, and it was a training for six months. And then I was going to be placed into a, a police, uh, a, you know, a, a, in the state I could be, you know, I was guaranteed a job, you know, and I'm, i and for me out of college, that was big for me right then. Um, uh, so I knew what I was going to do. And I, I said, I'm already too old. And, and it was, well, you can go until you're 26. And it was just constant, you know, you need to go. And they said, they shared stories about um, her mom's dream about something about having extra kids and, and, and that, and I don't know how that applies, but they just kept saying really deep stories that as a, as a young man, I was just, I don't know why you're sharing this with me, but they were sharing these stories and, um, her dad was, you know, just, he, he said that I could be his top advisor on a mission. He would put me as, he, he said, you'd be a, you'd be a great leader on the mission field. I guess it was just trying to stroke my ego at the time and, and that, and just, he had words for it, and I don't understand all the words. I didn't serve a mission, but he used acronyms and stuff like that. <laughs> I didn't understand at the time either, but um, they were just really wanting me to go. And uh, once I finally said no, um, it was a completely different fill. They were just completely, it was a switch. Um, and it was, you could just tell that it was. And I, I will say her dad was more understanding then I think the mom, he was the one I could go and talk to. I could never go talk to her, but I could go talk to him. And he even said, we're trying to work on some things here at, um, um, a little bit when he mentioned that. Um, Alluding that maybe he was acknowledging that she was yeah. being a little extreme. Yeah. He says, we're trying to work with her a little And he, he said, her na- yeah, her name, and we're trying to work on some things there. Um, this, is, this is when we were... We were engaged at the time after this conversation. This was a few weeks later, a month later, after we had been engaged. He says, we're trying to work on some things there in that. And he didn't go into detail, but. Yeah. I had to hide the engagement. <laughs> so. You had to hide the yeah, engagement? Yeah, I had to hide. I couldn't tell anybody. Hmm. He got, oh, the, your parents asked you to not tell anyone. I couldn't tell my parents. Oh. Before he, he asked. So he asked me, and then he went and talked to them. Okay. So I had to hide it. I had to hide it. And from them. From them. I couldn't wear my ring. I couldn't do anything. I hid it. But because? I, didn't. I wasn't, I, it wasn't going to happen. Like, I, they were not allowing it. And, and so, and I, here's, I remember, so <coughs> I, um, I was, um, Sorry, my brain blocked out. But I, but I'm sorry. I can, I can say one question. thing while you're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm trying to make sense of this. Like, as a parent now, of course, I don't care if my kids' partners are missions, but, but I'm, you know, if I'm projecting myself back as a believing Mormon or as a practicing Mormon, it's hard for me to imagine if my kids came to me, if they, if they had courted someone long enough to kind of know they wanted to marry them, I can't imagine saying, even bringing that up. Like, Mm -hmm. it's more like, hey, are you guys friends? How do you get along? Mm -hmm. What are your plans? How do you think about, you know, your future? Mm -hmm. I can imagine that type of conversation, but not like go on a mission. You know, when when the guy's asking. So, so like, that does feel pretty extreme to me. Mm -hmm. And then I'm trying to make sense of it. And, you know, I do know that within Mormonism, there's... There are these sorts of families that my family was never like this, but it was like they want, they like have this picture wall and they like want every kid, every male to serve a mission 
and then they want every every daughter to marry or turn missionary, and then they want all the kids to to be temple married, mm-hmm. and like that's like this badge of honor, and and then of course they would never no empty chairs, and they would never want any kid to ever leave the church, mm-hmm. and you know if if you're if it's if it's a really harsh family, then they 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 kind of have their wall of glory. And like, that's a really important part of their ego. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that was kind of the profile of your parents, in particular, your mom. Yeah. yeah. And if and if you, Adam, were just kind of messing up their wall of glory <laughs> or, or their bragging rights of like, we were good parents. We were good Mormon parents. No, yeah, I, I that's totally how it was for, I mean, um, and later, I mean, later on to find out that they were telling people in the community that I was not even active or I was not even at a member. There are people who believe that I wasn't even a member that were finding out, oh, you married the, the non-member. And I was, we were, and, and she called my bishop oh, at, when we were dating um, to find out about my family and that. And she, uh, there was something about us being inactive. He said, they're not I don't know how he put it, but my dad worked a lot of Sundays. So we didn't go, we weren't a hundred percent active. I think, I don't even know how that came up. We had to have a conversation with my Bishop about that. Cause he apologized. He says, I didn't mean to come off like you guys were inactive. And I don't know why he entertained the conversation with her, but she came back at, at uh, Ariana says they're not even active members and, and, and that. So, um, yeah. So like, I can't imagine calling the Bishop of, yeah. My yeah. child's fiance to to get info about their family. Yeah. Like this is um, part of the smear. They're trying to smear. I'm trying to gather yeah, dirt. Gather dirt. So, so Jen, I want to sanity check with you because yeah. I I wasn't raised in Utah. Mm-hmm. I was raised Orthodox Mormon, but mm-hmm. sometimes outside of Utah can be different than inside of Utah. Maybe. <laughs> Does this do you did you know families like this? Is this like an extreme story for you? Is this a typical story for you? Um your Utah experience. Yeah. My experience, I guess um I'll say two two different kind of things, but when I was a believing member and a mom, there definitely is like a perfection thing within the LDS church that like you know, there's the checklist, you know, did you get baptized? Did you get your medallion in young women's? Did you, you know, did you go on, go on a mission? Are you not dating until you're 16? You know, there's definitely a checklist of like, um, are you being perfect in these things? And, um, I know that, you know, I've actually apologized to my daughters now and we've had some good heart to hearts because, I did, I did ask them to be perfect in those things, you know, as a mom, you know, I remember, um, in a large group where, um, my daughter was kind of the center of attention saying, saying she was perfect. Like she, she's never done anything to make me worry about her. And, um, I knew, I knew that they had been brought up feeling that pressure to like be, be perfect. And, um, so it's, um, deconstructing now from the mainstream LDS faith. There's a lot of, I'm sorry, as I've had to say, you know, and a lot of, I wish I would have, you know, been better. I wish I would have known better and done better. You know, but now I'm trying to, now that I know better, do better. And I think that there's definitely that perfection that you're told to, you know, have your family look like or check the boxes of. But then there's a whole other level in some families where there is a wall, like there is an actual wall in their house where you only get your picture on it when you go on a mission or you get married in the temple. Um, or if you don't want a mission and get married in the temple, maybe you're still not on there. You know, they don't, you don't get to be on the wall, you know, and even really? like you're not parents your head, have right? a wall. They do. Yeah. yeah. Like I just brought up the wall randomly. No, it's uh, like when I went to get my patriarchal blessing, it like 
they, I was sitting in the patriarch's front room while he took my daughter into a separate room to ask her questions before she got her blessing. And his wife sat on there and there's pictures all over of their kids, you know, in the room. And so we're talking about her children and she, she told me about each one of them. And then she got to the one that was older, but not married yet. And she started like explaining to me like why she's not, why she's not married, but you know, um, her page girl blessing says she will. I don't know. She just was like giving excuses and like making it like a big deal that she hadn't checked off all these things, like that all her other kids had checked off. And like, that's why she just had a little picture like on the side table. But not on the wall. Right. So like, it's just hard for him. It's just hard. Cause there, there is a certain like perfection society that I think I brought my girls up in, you know, that I am trying so much better not to do anymore. But then there's the extra, mm-hmm. the families that are at, there's this extra that something else is some, some kind of outward thing they have to have. And I, I don't, I didn't have that, that outward need, but I, that was very, I saw it very often. Okay. Sorry, that was a lot, a no, long fine. Ex- explanation Did about that. Did you grow up in that type of family? No. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Are you going to say something about the wall? We no, about. I would just say that there was, there was one, you know, that's just what it is. There's the mission wall. There's a map and then there's their who served a mission and a line to who served a mission. There's a wall, but that's just what that is. But it's interesting that when you brought up your patri- ba- patriarchal blessing, that reminded me of something that my mom did while we, while I was engaged. So, um, Essentially, I mean, this was a, a traumatic event that I'm going to recount. Was just, um, I, there was a day you just never knew when she was going to drop, when she was going to rage, or she was going to do discard. One day I was driving in a car, a car with her, and um, it was um, actually I, I had gotten my eyes checked and I was getting some glasses, and and um, we were walking out to the parking lot. Um, and I was walking after her. She, yeah, I was walking after her because she was walking ahead of me, and she said, um, I, I called up to her, I said, Mom, and wait up, and she turned around, she said, don't call me mother. And, and it was like, okay, and she just would rage out of nowhere, and I had to get in the car with her, and then she we were driving down the road and she stopped and she told me to get out of the car and I didn't know what to do I mean she would just rage and I got out of the car and I had nothing I had nothing and my mom had just dropped me off and told me to get out of the car and I and I walked to the university and called his mom collect because I had nowhere to go and, and it was just a, like a kind of one of those things, this just happened. I don't know what to do. I have nowhere to go. And, um, and he, he drove down and he picked me up and, and he took me back. And here is how, how, how good I was. I mean, good. I didn't want to stay with him. I ended up staying with an uncle. I could have very well had sex with my <laughs> fiance or whatever. I wasn't going to. I was going to get married in the temple. I went and I stayed with an uncle, and the narrative I found out later was that she told people I ran away, and I didn't. I didn't run away, but forever people believed that I ran away. I didn't run away, but and and I'm talking. I bring up the patriarchal blessing. This is where this I'm getting at is, I was at. Um, either I can remember if it was my uncle's house or if I was if it was sent to his parents' house, but there's a, my patriarchal blessing was sent in the mail while I was away. And there was a, a note, basically that was typed, it was from the church office building addressed to me, and there was a letter included in it typed saying, and it was written as if it was me. And I didn't write a letter. And it said that I needed a copy of my patriarchal blessing. 
because I didn't have one. And it was signed, my name in red ink at the bottom, signature, my name. I didn't, I didn't do anything like that. And so I called my mom and I said, I, do you know anything about this? And she said, oh, no. What, what, no, I don't. And she just said she didn't know anything about it. And I, and I said, and she said, well, what does your patriarchal blessing say? And she said, mine says that I need to heed to the counsel of my parents. And she said, what does yours say? Mm. And I said, and it said the same thing. And she said, interesting. But she, she forged my name to, in a letter to the church office building to get my patriarchal blessing sent to me so she could use it against me. Like if she could find it saying, obey your parents, yeah. then she would use that as a club. She used that. She weaponized my blessing hmm. to get me to heed to the counsel of my parents. Mm. And, um, but that was, you know, that whole engagement and they fought me till the very end. Yeah, go ahead. So she was just desperate for she was this marriage not desperate. to happen. Desperate. She yeah. told me about women leaving their husbands at the altar and my wedding day, you know, and here's another thing, my wedding pictures. I, um, I, um, went to my house to get my wedding dress and I had a friend curl my hair for the pictures and my mom had never communicated the thing is they don't communicate what they want she never communicated to me that she wanted me to wanted to do my hair and I went and she got mad she got so full of rage um, and she went to hit me and um she missed, and she, she fell down, and she pretended like she was dead on the floor. She, and I came to her rescue. I said, Mom, what's, because she looked like she had hurt herself, and it was my fault. And, and then she looked up several seconds later, and she said, I've been fasting for you. And she said, it was my fault that she fell down because she was fasting for me not to marry him. Um, and that was, it was my fault. And, and it was this constant that, and, and, I, and she, wouldn't, she refused to give me a ride to get my pictures taken. I didn't have a car. And I'm here, I mean, I'm in this, I mean, this is a lot, of, you know, I was in this war zone of, you know, I had a younger sister out back door. I had an older sister here and they were all raging against me. And I didn't have anywhere to go. I had a brother here that was the, she had built her army against me. I had nowhere to go. I walked out the back and I had a younger sister. And she hit me. And I, I remember walking, walking up the street holding my wedding dress. I had nowhere to go. I didn't have a right to get my own wedding pictures taken. <laughs> I was holding my wedding dress. <laughs> and she sped up in the car and she slammed the brakes. And she said, get in, you look like an idiot. <laughs> and then, I mean, you don't fight back. You just do. And so I just rode in that car with her to get my wedding pictures taken and I was crying <laughs> and the people were so nice and I didn't tell them why. You don't tell them why. It was my fault. I had hurt my mom. I was bad for getting married. <laughs> I, I didn't say a word. Um, but they took me outside. My wedding pictures are outside from a distance because they couldn't do up close. <laughs> Um, but my mom and dad came in. Couldn't do up close. I couldn't do up close pictures. I was, I just, I was crying. Mm -hmm. I'm, in my wedding picture, I'm looking down at flowers from a distance. They couldn't do any up close pictures of me. Um, but my parents came in the middle of that session, and my mom does what she does. She, she told them her narrative. I don't know what she told them. And, 
But she built her army against me. There was nowhere safe in that town. Because he had already told her story that I was, run I was a runaway. I was a, all of these things. And I was marrying, you know, and he was bad and his parents. And it was just, you can feel it when the smear campaign is on. You have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. And you have no defenses. And you believe yourself that you're bad. Mm -hmm. You know, but that was the first discard Yes. And that gathering an army sort of idea, that is a classic narcissistic trait. Is that right? Yeah. So it's called a smear campaign clinically. But I remember feeling like there was an army against me. Like it was everywhere. I mean, people knew things and people would say things. And, and so those were my words for it before I even know, knew that there were was an actual word for it. I would say she's gathered her army. I don't, I don't know. That was my word mm -hmm. for it. I don't know. No, my, well, my first, uh, no, she was very, very good. I mean, just good personality. Just, I mean, she was very, just didn't partake in anything. Like I could just alcohol, drugs, nothing. I mean, she was straight as an arrow. I mean, I felt like I couldn't even be in the same I, I was wondering why she would like me because I didn't, I wasn't like a bad guy, but I mean, I, in college, I, I drank, you know, a, a handful of times. I wasn't bad or anything, but, but I did the typical thing. And I, in high school, I did the typical thing, you know, um, and I had my day, but I wasn't, but she was just so good, like to a T, like very good, <laughs> not rebellious at all. Like at all. And my parents would contend that. They would, and I'm going to be honest with that because even though I did, I, when you are controlled, your only recourse, and this is how narcissistic families work, is you, you either totally reflect back to them what they're putting out there, what they want you to be, or you, are, or you rebel and you're deemed a scapegoat, or you are just kind of a gray rock and you kind of fly under the radar and learn how to hide things. And, but those, those uh, characteristics are inter interchangeable and, and people within the system play them at different times, okay? But every one of them, every one of us trying, you, you try to be the favorite child. Everybody wants to be the favorite child and earn favor with their, with their family. And it's no different than the church. You're trying to learn, earn favor with, with God, you're trying to mirror, reflect back those things. And, but it's an impossible thing if you, if you want to differentiate, if you want to have a sense of self, it's impossible. And so even just the little things for me to try to have a sense of self and differentiate, that's what would cause a drop. And then I would be deemed a scapegoat. And then I would always try to climb my way back. I was never a very good gray rock because I always had a guilty, guilty conscience. <laughs> so like I was always, I wanted to be transparent. I, I was always like, wanted approval. And so I didn't hide things. I, was, I always wanted approval. Hmm. And so I guess I can imagine a scenario where a kid would act out in response to abuse. And yeah. that maybe that's a reasonable... Yeah, Especially I, for a, a, young, a teenager, mm -hmm. I guess if, if a teenager feels mistreated, mm -hmm. they very, very well might be a, a, um, yeah, be, be a difficult child, but in reaction to abuse. Yeah, that's the thing. And the, the thing is, like, it's again, you have adults and you have children, okay? And so I, we have teenagers. And, and, like, I need to be the adult in the situation, Okay, so it's like, was I, I was very de developmentally appropriate, mm -hmm. if I want to say that. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it goes back to blaming the child. It's, children are going to rebel in very high demand situations, or they're not. Like, you really only get a couple of character, characters out of that. And they can blame them all they want, but it's really just children wanting to differentiate. And the end of the day, abuse is abuse. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I, it doesn't matter how a kid behaves; a parent should never be abusive. Yeah. And the the only other thing I, that comes across my mind is like, well, they must have thought Adam was just a horrible human being, mm -hmm. 
Like, let's just say my child wanted to marry someone really dangerous. Mm -hmm. Then I could see myself really opposing it, right? But the only, how long have you guys been married now? Like twenty, almost twenty one. <laughs> and just just my sense of Adam right now is not a dangerous guy, no. like a mild mannered, <laughs> kind kind of nice guy. Yeah, right? I haven't met a single person <laughs> who has said an ill word about him ever. Anyone. Like ever, I haven't. I just hide it really well. No, but he, you, you, I have not. <laughs> so 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 the idea that your parents were like terrified that you were marrying a monster. That's no, not, no, that it was, it like was that. simply that he didn't serve a mission. <laughs> yeah. That was it. That and, was and it. And mostly that it was, I would even say that it was breaking the appearance, the social appearance that yeah. your parents had perfectly raised the perfect Mormon children, right? Yeah. I broke the mold. You broke you early broke. on. I broke the mold. Like, yeah. I didn't, yeah. you know, and yeah. Jen, you wanted to, I think, add something. Well, I know I was just like, I was just going to say that it seems like, yeah, Adam's not, <laughs> obviously Adam's not bad. It's just, it seems to me that the appearance of it is what matters. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to be whatever is going to serve that is what is going to happen or th what they're going to try to make happen. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Okay. Please don't. And I, I'm going to get comments from viewers like, stop doubting your story. Stop, you know, but you, I'm okay. trying to reflect the types of yeah. questions that people right. might think so that. that you have a chance to kind of address it. I get a little worried because it's like, I don't want to jump ahead, but like, it gets worse. Yeah. Like, it gets worse. Mm. Yeah. Like, this is just, it gets yeah. so much worse. Okay. And, okay. And so... I don't want to say stay tuned and think like, I don't know what to say. Like it gets worse. Okay. All right. Well, I'm so sorry. No, so where do okay. we, like Jen says, where do we go from here? <laughs> well, we got married. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that was the happy, the happy ending to a terrible, terrible thing. It happened. You know, I, I stood, I mean, I remember this is again, just, I, my wedding day is probably one of the worst days of my life. I got ready. I dressed myself in my aunt's bathroom. Nobody helped me. I got myself dressed in my own hair inside my aunt's bathroom. And then I went and I sat down on the couch and I, we were gonna be late. And I told my dad, I said, we're gonna be late. And he said, we'll go when we're ready. So I sat there, I sat there on the couch and waited. And I just did what I was supposed to do. Um, but, and I don't want to jump back too much, but when I went through the temple, and this is part of just the Mormon stories, it's kind of, when I went through the temple, um, it was not a good experience at all. Um, it was um, to the, we went, when we got there in the parking lot, well, that's, this was the wedding. Okay, but when I went through, when I went through the temple, you know, you, you make your, your covenants and things and the law of consecration. My, my mom was next to me and she stood up and she glared at me. She just glared at me. That was why she couldn't, she was making covenants and I was breaking covenants. My first time in the temple. I did not like that place at all. It did not feel safe to me. And I felt like, again, there was something wrong with me. I don't like this place. Um, but then when we, when we got married... She felt like your marrying a non-returned missionary was somehow violating her temple covenants mm -hmm. with God. I am merely in a narcissistic family system. You are merely a reflection of that person. And so by extension, it's her. I am her. I'm not her daughter. I am her. And so there was no differentiation. If I wasn't doing what I was told, it was going to reflect badly on her. And, and so that's how that, so she couldn't, you know, and 
Yeah. And so when I, when the day of our wedding and I was late, um, almost late, we just barely got there, um, I walked out of the car and we saw his dad and he was wearing a blue shirt um, because those were our colors. He was wearing his blue dress shirt. And, and my dad said, um, um, the only person who wears a colored shirt in the temple is Satan. Because um, I guess in the temple videos, or temp I never seen a live one, but he said the only one. That's what he said on my wedding day, walking into the temple. So, and nice, you know, nothing was said about I was getting married. Hmm. Did, did your mom say, like, you look beautiful. We're Not so always. proud for you, Not for being here, Ari. No. Oh, my heart is just breaking. <laughs> Not once. Mm. That's hard. Not once. Nope. She was so concerned about my wedding dress. It was the middle of July, end of July. It was the end of, sorry, I know our, I know our anniversary, I promise. It was the end of July, and my mom wanted me to, she said, my wedding dress, if I was going to wear my wedding dress in the temple, it needed to be all the way down to my wrist, all the way up to, you know, and it was the middle of July. I mean, I didn't want to, so I had a short sleeve dress. That, that was the one thing that I, I didn't have a single say in anything in my wedding, not a single say, but I wanted a short sleeve wedding dress. That's it. Um, and so I fought for that, but um, the women in the temple um, actually commented about how modest my wedding dress was because I only just had to wear a jacket over it, um, where other girls, they have to put like inserts and things to, to make them, but they just had to put a jacket on mine. And, but my mom fought, you know, I, but that was the one thing I got was my wedding dress was short sleeve. Mm. No, she never once said anything. Didn't help me do my hair. Even though she fought on my wedding picture day, she didn't offer. I was a problem. Mm. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I can't look at those pictures. I know where they are. I don't look at them. Mm. It just seems so weird to me that... That her, like, getting married in the temple is a checkoff. You know what I mean? It's a check mark. It's not like in the LDS religion. Like, I'm just, like, I don't know. I guess I'm just feeling like even in an LDS, like, strict family would be, that would be like a celebration day. You know, it would be like a, we're so proud of you, even though he didn't serve a mission, we're so proud that you're here at the temple making covenants together. And like, that would still be, even if they disagreed with Adam earlier, they would still be ex celebrating that day, I guess, in some way with her. So it's kind of breaking my heart that it's like still a problem or like, um, and then the comment about his dad, I don't know. It's just, but the, the most thing that I'm sad for is just, um, I guess, the missed opportunities to connect with her daughter on that day, no matter. Because it's a special day. She's there at the temple. She answered all the questions. They both did. You know, it's... Um, we didn't have premarital sex. Yeah. We made it. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't do anything. Yeah, that's hard. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. If you say this is just the beginning, so we've got yeah. a lot to cover. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's beautiful. <laughs> it's tragic, and it's it's beautiful that you're being so vulnerable and honest. It's tragic that that's the way your relationship started out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but the thing about, do you have anything to say about that, the wedding day? How was it for you? Are you okay? Or do you wanna? Um, no, I was just looking back. It was, it's tainted and it was stressful. It wasn't fun. 
and my my family, there was contention there, and there's always been. And it was very content. Our wedding day was, there was contention, the whole thing. And so Your family? Between. You could just feel the contention. There was, there, there was no, like, warm feelings. My mom had it out on the phone with her mom because <laughs> it, it came down to that. It was a couple weeks before we were getting married, and there was some planning or something going on, and her mom was, I don't remember the context of it, but my mom, I just know walking into her room, she was screaming and yelling on the phone at her mom <laughs> about something, and just... She, it was like mm. oh, talking to a wall. Just she wasn't. It was just very. So from that point on, it was just not. And any family gatherings we've had since then, they've been cordial, but it's just been. They were never warm to my family like they were to as I would see other families come into their family marriage wise. They were very m- more open and warm, especially well, at least in public. They weren't to my family. So I don't know. That's hard. The difference of treatment. Yeah. And well, and and I and I can see I'm kind of maybe thinking like you, uh, the questions that people might ask. Her age wasn't a factor, and that's one of the things I asked her. I thought her parents would have a problem with that because she was younger, and I had that deep conversations with them and her, because that's one thing. As a senior and dating a freshman, I thought I, you know, wanted to have that conversation. And I did have in the back of my mind that, because I had had problems with girls before about not serving a mission, I had a girl flat out tell me, it was the picture on the wall, it was all that. She says, my grandma, going back generations, had married returned missionaries, I can't marry you, so this can't go any further. And we had gone dating for half the year, my my sophomore year of college, or my, maybe my junior girl. This other girl, yeah, and she just said, I, I can't. I've had that conversation with my grandparents and my mom, and I can't go any further with you because you're not a return missionary. So when we started a date, I had that conversation with her, and her, and I, so I guess I was, I felt like we were on a good path because I felt like it wasn't going to be a problem. And then when it became, it was a problem, so. Not the age. Not the age, but the, the, but the mission. Yeah, that was, was never brought up. That mm-hmm. I was in this, is like, that's the number one red flag there, but they didn't say a word. Mm-hmm. I think in their mind, they wanted, they were doing missionary work to get me to go on a mission, and the, their end goal was to to do that. And influence and when, future generations. And when I told them no, it was, a, okay. So then, or yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. we okay. were told that, he would, I was told he would never be able to bless our children. And just because he didn't, you know, it just affects, you know, and all of these things. And it was basically a mixed faith marriage is what we were doing, (laughs) which, you know, wasn't the case. But, yeah, but we got married and and things were okay. But the thing is, again, I always wanted to earn favor. Even, Even with the abuse, I was going to prove to my parents and my siblings, because I had younger ones. I knew that I was, that he was talked bad about. I knew I was talked bad about, but I was going to prove them wrong. That even though he didn't serve a mission, we were gonna be that Mormon family. That, you know, we could still do the thing. And so I spent the next 20 years trying to prove to my, my family that I wasn't what they said I was. You know, my sons were going to serve missions. We were going to go to church. We were going to do the thing. We were going to be that family. And, and this is where I have to say I did damage to my children trying to be her because you just want to earn favor. It sucks being the scapegoat. It sucks. And I didn't embrace that. I wanted to be a good sister. I wanted to be a good daughter. I wanted to be a good mom. I wanted to be a good wife. I wanted to be what I was supposed to be. And so I did it. I did it. 
and I have a lot of apologizing to do, and I have, you know, and I molded him, but he liked his hair long. I couldn't change that. <laughs> but I, I am not innocent in the mother. I was, I'm not innocent because I did it too. Are you comfortable sharing how many kids you guys have ended up having? Yes, it's fine. <laughs> we have nine. We have nine children. I nine did Nine biological nine children? Nine biological children. Yeah. Singlets, no twins. <laughs> we have nine kids. And was part of that being the a model, mm -hmm. size of a model Mormon family? I must be multiplied and replenish the earth. Hmm. And I love my... Okay, go ahead. <laughs> No. Okay, I'm sorry. I feel like I talk too much, and he has such a good take no, on a lot of things. But, like, yes, I did. And I was, I, I did graduate from college, and I ran all four years. We didn't have, we actually we didn't have kids right away. And that was a problem a little bit, you know, because we were told that, you know, I, I was told that if I was going to get married, then I needed to be ready to have children. But I couldn't because I had a scholarship. There is no way I could. And so I, I didn't. We were three years before we started having kids. But I grew up, that's another part of I, I grew up with that whole, you need to have children early and often. Um, you, you know, my mom, you know, and, and thankfully I didn't have problems with that because I knew my mom had thoughts on that. You know, early in the church, I know that there were some things said, I don't know when, but that people were more valiant in the pre-existence and so got more blessings. That is something that was taught earlier on. And, and my mom said that, you know, she was more valiant in the pre-existence, and that's why she had so many children. And so thankfully I had children, and I didn't get slapped with the non-valiant and the pre-existence at least. So for your mom, quantity of children correlated with valiance, mm -hmm. righteousness, yeah. both in this life and in the previous mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Yeah. She told me once about a dream she had because she had a friend who could not have children, who was barren. And she said that she had a dream that her friend didn't wasn't as valiant in the pre-existence. And so I grew up with that. And then she would say things like, point out people, oh, they're being very, they're married, but they're not having children now, so they're being selfish because they're, they're putting off having children. You're not supposed to put off having children. But I had to. We had to put off having children. And... Um, and then I, I started, I worked, too, the first couple of years of having kids. I taught school, um, and that was really hard for me because my place was in the home, and I needed to have children. And so I did it. I did everything I could to be at home with my kids, even though we kept having them. And that's almost impossible <laughs> to provide for a family on one income. So it was really hard. I'm having a really hard time with this. <laughs> um, I guess what I'm having a hard time is with a woman explaining or telling another woman or women in general that her value is based, her value not even on this earth, but her value from her Heavenly Father in this context is based on the number of children she has or if she even can have that. And... um 
what that says or what that would say to you and also to any other woman that is in your family that maybe maybe possibly struggled with that or will in the future. Um, So to say that, like, to be so strict in the religion and then also she's saying that that comes from their heavenly father, Mm -hmm. like, that's, that's hard. That's hard. That's, um... It was hard to, you know, but I, I believed that that was my purpose and that, and I, and also there was no contention when I was having children. My mom loved me when I was having children. We had that bond that we didn't have before I was having children. And so I have to sit with that because it's one of those and moments, I guess, where I love each and every one of my children so much and could not even imagine a single one of them not being here. And I know that I did what I was told. I did. And so it doesn't mean that having children was a bad choice. It was the choice that I made, and I'm so grateful for it. And I just, I have, but I also have to acknowledge it was my conditioning in that I really craved acceptance from my mom. And I craved connection with her. And we connected. In my childbearing years, we connected. So that's one of those things that I just have to, you know, I was molded and I was becoming her. I have almost as many children as her and the same girl to boy ratio. (laughs) You know, I have a lot of brothers. I have a lot of sons. So your mom had more kids than you did. Mm -hmm. And you had nine. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. And so... I'm just curious, Adam, how many kids, how many siblings did you have growing up? Um, I, I grew up with two. I was the oldest of three. <laughs> so this nine thing wasn't your idea? No. 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 <laughs> no. Okay. See, well, no, it's okay. I went I'm fine. I, I'm fine. Like, I don't have anything to hide. I'm fine. <laughs> I was becoming her. I was. I have to acknowledge that. I was becoming it. Um. I was doing what I was told, doing what I was supposed to do. I was reflecting. But in the the church, it's just, you just, you do. You go and do. You go and do. And and I did. And I didn't have any, I was doing it. (laughs) So I guess I can't, Mm. you know, it's not a bad thing. It's what I did. And I was wanting to be that because that's, I earn favor with my mom of doing that. I earn favor with God for doing this. Mm. It was it was what I did. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. So, right. How did they treat? Did they treat Adam any different during those like years where you were having like children and where you found favor? Did they allow Adam to have some favor during that time? They've always been really good to Adam since we married, to our faces. Okay, so. Well, in that first couple of years, they weren't really coming down. They didn't visit until we had our firstborn. Then they started to kind of come. I mean, we were always, we didn't live too far away our first couple of years, but we weren't super close um, to them like we were during having children. Once we started having, we got, yeah, we yeah. got It's what they do. It's what they would, from what I've read, it, it's when the daughter starts to have children is when they kind of make their way back in. And it was one of those things, and I often explain, I was more of an adult at 18 than I was at 25 to 30, 
because I got back in that mother-daughter role again. I assimilated back into child mode. And um, that's kind of how that happened. And, and I think they treated him okay, but they also, as far as blessings and things, oh my gosh, like those were so stressful, like baby blessings and things because he, it was put in my head that because he didn't serve a mission, he couldn't, he didn't know the verbiage. Mm. He didn't know how to say the blessings. And honestly, those days were our worst. We got in the biggest fights. <laughs> um, you can attest to this, right? On um, baby blessing days. Because I was so scared of not looking the part. And that, that does fit the pattern a bit because the baby blessing is a public, generally it's a public event. Yeah. And so they would, I mean, it also makes sense that like once you got married, mm -hmm. like, okay, well, they fought, they fought because you were messing up the appearance of the plan. So you had horrible fights up until the actual wedding day. Well, then the marriage, marriage happens and it's like, okay, well, we did what we could to uh, have the perfect appearance. Then they're treating you okay. Mm -hmm. But, but this idea of the baby blessings fits the pattern of kind of this real over obsession with public image. Yeah. And it fits it for me because I wanted that image. I was not going to give them the satisfaction that they were right. Okay. So we, and so I think I, a couple of times we tried to rehearse it with him, you know, and yeah. that caused more stress for him. Was, I was like, we've got, you know, they can't, and my, I don't think I communicated it to him that they can't know. Well, I think he did. I did. And I, I think did. it was always, <laughs> it was always known that there was, I had to be more uh, spiritual in that way to show them. And there was always that level of, uh, we have to show them that, you know, that I'm good enough to, or in, in the LDS, um, so. He didn't like wearing white shirts. <laughs> that was a problem. He didn't like wearing white shirts. And he would fight me on that a <laughs> lot. Like, wear the white shirt. <laughs> but there were a couple of times when my dad corrected him during the blessing. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Ugh. Yeah. Would, yeah. Oh, and again, the shirt, the shirt thing about yeah. Satan and, and yeah. the shirts, that's right. also shirts an appearance. Like the brethren. Yeah. That's an appearance uh -huh. thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then yep. your dad correcting yeah. the blessing is an yeah. appearance thing. So I'm it's just heard. a real fascination with appearance, which fits the description of a narcissistic pattern. Okay. You're saying something, Jen? I was just saying, I've never heard someone correct someone in a baby blessing. No. Oh. No. Have you? you? Haven't? Uh -uh. Have you? Oh, oh no. wow. Never I've heard it several unless, times. Oh. <laughs> I mean, unless you like, I mean, if you were to say like, dear Satan at the beginning or something, <laughs> no, but I mean, you start saying Heavenly Father, right? Like, yeah. it's hard to mess that up. I'm, I guess I was just saying like, it's not like the baby, but I, I'm trying to wonder why and they were so stressed about it. And like, but even the baptismal thing, it's, you learn it like the first week of your mission and then you kind of have it. So, yeah, so the he, fact that they, didn't feel like he could kind of like figure that part out. I mean, yeah. it, I guess they were just worried about it, but uh, it just, I guess I'm, for those who don't know about the baptismal, it's like so-and-so having been commissioned of Jesus Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen, mm -hmm. and baptize them, right? And then the confirmation prayer has a little bit more of how you need to start out or I don't know. Yeah, I guess what I'm saying is like even like people have messed up, mm -hmm. but no one's, I haven't heard someone correct them. I guess, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah, know. he said it. He he would whisper to him. Mm. Do you remember that? The first okay. couple. I mean, after the first couple, well, I got. We had a lot of practice. <laughs> no, so if we only had three kids, it would the, be every time. I think the most stressful one was the first yeah. first blessing, which it would be anyway. Yeah. But uh, just the level of that, yeah, and but it was always there was always that in the back of our minds, and always with her. Yeah, it had to be a certain way and a certain image. And I think that might be fair to say with any blessing as well. But it was, mm -hmm. it was again, that next level of yeah. stress. Because, I mean, of course, my parents wanted 
it to look good as well, the parents, but it was not like the, the level of stress put on us that had to be a certain way and a certain image is the, uh, the hyper even, concern. I yeah. guess I'm just more saying that I was that way, that mm. I had taken that on. I'm not trying to mm. throw because this is like, oh. this is probably, you know, mm. the I was becoming that way, and I was concerned about how my children looked, how my husband looked, if we looked the part. Mm. Okay, so I was becoming that mm -hmm. okay. and stuff, and so that's mm. more me throwing myself under the bus <laughs> is what yeah. I'm doing. And I, you know, I was very, you know, guilty and shamey about, you know, we need to go to church, we need to do this, we need to look the part, we need to act the part. And I, you know, was just, and this is just, this is what people do. It's not, you know, and, and this is, you know, it's just all part of a high demand system is you are a high demand religion is you go and you do and you you just you are molded to be them and you are earning favor in other words you're become to wanting to be that favorite child mm -hmm. you know and and that's mm. kind of and what you're saying is you pass it on to your you start passing it on yeah. And replicating the system yeah, in your own system. Yeah, it's just the way it is. It yeah. just happens. It's by design. Yeah. 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 Well, and you're saying, like, that was the years that you felt you had, like, the favoritism. Mm -hmm. Like, you were, you, you were, were, you're starting to feel like you were finally okay, mm -hmm. you know, and doing what you're, yeah. fitting the mold that uh -huh. she wanted you to fit. And we were the favorite family, too. I had, I did it. I climbed the ladder. We were the favorite family. Oh. Oh, so you were succeeding in the hustle. Mm -hmm. I did. They loved our family. They were over. We were over. I earned favor. Mm. So it's not all bad. It, it doesn't always feel bad. No. Sometimes it feels good. It felt so good to be loved. Mm. You know, it does. It felt so good. You know, we went there and my kids loved it and they miss it now. But I'm not trying to jump ahead, but they loved it. Mm. And it wasn't a, you know, the thing is, if it was all bad, I wouldn't have stayed. You know, if the church was all bad, I wouldn't have stayed. You know, and that's something with narcissism is the love bombing. That's another term. It's just, they can love as hard as they can hate. And they loved us. And, um, and it's so much so that I forgot about the abuse for the most part, because I was I was favored. Yeah, when I forgot about the whole build up to our marriage, because they were so good to. I mean, it was they were. It was a very good relationship. Very, you know, they just so. I mean, I can't take away the good things they did for us. Though it was very. So I mean, mm. very good. That just so would good. make it disorienting. Yeah, it was very hard because I would have moments, yeah, and I don't want to, I would have my moments when I would start to remember things. And my dad being a therapist, my only therapist, there were times I would call him and I would try to talk to him. And then he would, like, I would have my moments for sure. And then and I go quiet, and then, but I was always redirected to look at all of the good things. Look at all of the things we've done. We've always been so so supportive of, of Adam. We've always loved your kids, like, but this happened, and I want to forgive you, but I want to acknowledge that this happened. And my dad would say things like, he would be concerned about Adam, about well, we've told Adam we we love him, we show him. And, and I was like, Adam's okay, but I'm not okay. Are you not concerned about me? I'm not okay. But it would never address with me. Hmm. Nothing that was done was ever addressed. Nothing, they just did not talk to me about it. It was always, look at what we're doing for you. And I would forgive, I forgive so much. And I still, you know, it's not even about that. And you'll learn as you go in my story, it's narcissism is 
the abuse wasn't the worst of it. It's, it wasn't. It just isn't. What do you mean? Um, lies. Hmm. I, they lie. And that's how my world just crashed down this past year. They lie. It's less about, I can forgive being hit. I can forgive even being emotionally, you know, spiritually abused, but lying. You don't lie. Mm. And narcissists lie. And that's, I don't know how much I jump ahead. <laughs> no, let's, well, let's just follow the story. So you have nine, mm-hmm. nine kids mm-hmm. and you're back top ranked as the mm-hmm. favorite couple. Yeah. And how does your story progress? Where do you, I mean, I'm sure that you could talk for days, but where I'm do you sorry. want the story to go next? Yeah, I don't want to talk for days. No, no, no I'm just saying that. <laughs> No, I don't want to, but <laughs> it's really just, we lived, if you could compare <laughs> Book of Mormon stuff, we lived, we lived a good life mm-hmm. with favor. Yeah. We did. Um, went to church. You know, we did have those, I mean, like couples do, you know, we, you know, when I would try to mold him to be, he would, you know, we have our, a lot of our contention as a couple was probably church related not not doctrinal but me just trying to be that and forcing the kids to go and forcing the kids to be this way and Adam would say you're going to make them not want to go <laughs> and I'm going to also guess that the way your parents viewed Adam from the start maybe colored how you viewed him over time mm-hmm. Or you kind of felt like you had married someone lesser than you maybe should have. It's true. (laughs) It's true. Like, it really, really is. You are given a... My parents gave me a lens to see. And how it was playing out, how they said it would play out, it was playing out. Okay, so, like, they said he... You know, it, that would, that if he wasn't as active, not that he was very active actually, but because he wasn't like. RM. Yeah. Then he wasn't on the same page as I was. And so that would be difficult. And I would have to string him along. That's actually true. That happened. And that, but the thing is, it's not a bad thing. Okay. As I, as my story, our story unfolds, that was actually a very good thing as it played out because I, having grown up in a family with two extremely devout people, there was no room to differentiate. But because I had him and he had differentiated, he had a sense of self um, and he wasn't about to be molded by me. That my, our kids didn't have that. They could, he, he would say, you know, don't be as hard on them. And so they had a buffer with him. And so what is, was bad was actually good and very healthy hmm. for our children to have that. So. so what's the next part of the story that you feel like is really critical so, to the... Now, fast forward to the part that gets hard. So, well, I w- um, a year ago, I had, well, it was actually January, no, anyway, end of 2020, I had a younger brother who um, announced that he was getting a divorce. And... Um, and I loved his wife, loved, loved, loved her. Um, she was so sweet to my children. She shared a birthday with one of my daughters. They danced in my kitchen. Um, my children loved her because she was sweet, not the over the top, but just good, you know. And they, throughout their marriage, they had 
some fertility problems, and and um, and I knew I was aware of that. And from what I could understand, what I knew that they were just going through this stuff to be able to have children, and then suddenly there was a divorce. And um, I got a phone call from my mom saying that this sister-in-law um, was um, had had faith crisis. Um, that she was no longer wearing her garments, and um, and that you know just all of those things that you know she was wearing things <laughs> and just yoga clothes, and I knew that this sister she actually worked for an athletic apparel company and had given us a lot of really cute things and anyway but it was communicated to me that she was on the going on the dark side okay and I remember saying to my mom I said well this this is not a time to shun her this is a time to love her like I just I had developed in my thinking enough um, to where, as the time went on, that I, I did not feel right about that. And but my brother, I mean, he, they ended up divorcing over her faith crisis, from what I was told, from what I was told, and and that, and I don't know about her faith crisis. That I was just told that she just it had to do with fertility and and in questioning her patriarchal blessing that said that she would be able to bear children. And so that was one of, and I, we were told to, to not to essentially block her because she was not okay. She was not an okay person. And I did not feel right about that. I'm... Um, can I ask a clarifying question? Mm -hmm. So from what I pieced together, it's possible that the sister-in-law was had been told in her patriarchal blessing that she would have kids, mm -hmm. but they had fertility problems, yeah. and that caused her to, yeah. that maybe was part of an impetus to a faith crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That then, when she started having a faith crisis, then became a, so she's not, having all the kids that the mother-in-law wants from her perspective that mm -hmm. your mother, her mother-in-law would have wanted. And now she's questioning her faith and then man, a divorce. That's mm -hmm. talk about the wall of shame instead yeah. of the wall of glory, mm -hmm. a temple marriage getting divorced for someone, for parents who value that wall of glory more than anything. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. that's bad news for everyone involved. Yes. And so I started, and then you're being made to demonize, mm -hmm that sister-in-law and cut them off. Mm -hmm. Okay. We were told to block her. We were told to block her phone number. We were told to unfriend her. We were told to all of those things, and I didn't do any of those things because I did not feel right about it. And I, that's when I started to question a lot of things. Like, why that doesn't... She's a good person. This is not okay. And so then I remember um, sitting across from Adam, and I wasn't questioning church things, but I just didn't like that. Um, and I asked him if I left the church, if he would leave me. And I don't, and, and he said no. Like it was like immediate. Do you remember that? And then he, I remember him being really uncomfortable, and he asked me the same question back, and I had to think about it. Like, I was like, I don't know. And then, because I was so indoctrinated that this was the way, the way to heaven, the way to eternal families. <sighs> So, but that's when I had to do some inward reflection a little bit. But we're jump. I'm sorry, we're we skipped over my sister, and that was my fault. Oh, so, that's fine. 
And I don't know how to do that because that happened before all that's of fine. this. That's fine. Jump back. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a that's a story, mm-hmm. and that's an important one. We we can go back in the we can go back in the crowds. Yes, fine. Okay. Um, in 2006, um, my older sister she died by suicide. She was. Uh, 27 months older than me. Um, but she, this is another thing. We were told that she came out, she came out to live with uh, um, my parents one summer because she was, she was really struggling. She had three kids in three years and she was really struggling. Um, and, um, from what I was told, my parents went out there where she was, where she lived, and brought her um, for a baby blessing. And her husband said that he didn't know what to do, that she was having such a hard time, and he asked for help from my parents. And um, so my mom brought my sister and her three kids back to their house, but suddenly there was a narrative that my brother-in-law was abusive. My mom told us that it was all his fault that she was sad and that it wasn't postpartum depression. It wasn't the fact she had three kids in three years. It wasn't the fact that her oldest son was autistic. It was her husband was abusive. And that was what my mother told us and she gave me eyes to see him and I couldn't help my sister that was not you know I I I I tried you know I she never told me anything about abuse she never ever did she never ever did she was always asking me about her kids and parenting I had my two oldest were I only had two kids at the time and they were same ages, but we talked about motherhood and, and she had a lot of questions. She was struggling with that aspect of life. Um, but she went, she, she eventually, she killed herself. Um, and I have learned since that a lot of the stories that my mom told were not true. And, um, and I have to, you know, it's, that's a really hard part is, you know, I, you know, we were told that, you know, she had attempted suicide one time before. Sorry, we were told that, um, my mom had, um, didn't tell my, my brother-in-law about it. And she said that they were going to take care of it and just pay the ambulance bill, pay the doctor bill, and that they just paid it and, and that they were protecting my sister from him. Um, so I, they were aware of an, a, a suicide attempt by your sister, and they chose not to tell her husband. Yeah. They didn't tell him because they, they blamed him. They, they were operating on the... We are protecting her from him. And it wasn't until this last summer when I connected with him. I, um, I'm the only one of my siblings who's had a relationship with him and my sister's kids. Um, but we were just talking, and he brought up how he found out. He said, I had to find out that my wife attempted suicide um, by getting a bill. And so that was not true. He got a bill in the mail after my sister died. And, he, and so, yeah. But, but again, as the years went on, my mom still talks. She blames him and has blamed him publicly in many ways, essentially um, accusing him of murdering my sister. 
even true. But um, so, yeah. I guess that fits that that trait of having to have someone to blame. Yeah, it does. Where if my sister was had postpartum depression or was having a difficult time being a mother, again, that's the, we are merely extensions of her. So if my sister was broken, that meant my mom was broken and my mom was not broken. If my sister was broken, that meant the system was broken. Our family was not broken. Only an outsider could be broken. And so that's how that worked out. And, and it's so hard because, I mean, my sister went for help, and she got the opposite, and she died. And I, this is not to blame anybody, but I was there a year ago. And so I know what she felt like. And so I can you go to the people you think are going to help you, and they don't help you. They kill you. <laughs> so now, fast forward to a year ago, I, I started to have some questions with regard to why we needed to block this sister-in-law. I didn't. And, and so I started to just kind oh, of, I'm, I'm sorry, so sorry, just, I jumped away from it. No, 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 it's good. Can I just summarize one yes, thing? Yes, please. Again, <clears throat> again your, your brother-in-law continues to fit the pattern of a scapegoat, mm -hmm. but also as uh, in the, the death by suicide is clearly a failure of the glory wall, a failure of the perfect Mormon family. Here you start it. You start it by marrying a non-returned missionary. Your brother is not able to have kids, and then gets divorced. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that's out of order because then previous yeah. to that, your sister dies by suicide. Like, like it's just all, it's all instances of the perfect Mormon family mm -hmm. perception um, being violated. Yeah, and that's when all the drama comes and that's when all the pain mm -hmm. follows and it's it's the price that's paid for an obsession with appearance exactly that's exactly what it is um yeah so you can't control everybody you can't control the narrative as much as you want to you just can't and that's what they are that's what they do and and, and there's this idea and with Buddhism. Buddhism starts with the idea that life is suffering. And it's not that life is only suffering. It's that suffering is inextricably connected to life. That's the reality. Mm -hmm. And attachment is, is wanting reality to be something other than it is. And that's the definition of suffering. Suffering is wanting life to be any other way than it really is. Mm -hmm. And so if it, the, the desire to create this perfect family, it's just the recipe for suffering for the parents, for all the kids, for all the in-laws, all the grandchildren. It's just like pure suffering. And I've seen this in my extended family where some of the most miserable people aren't the ones who lose their faith in the church or even leave the church. It's the ones who stayed in the church were super devoted in the church and then the more perfect Mormon dream doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. And so that, that facade fractures, people are set up for failure and disappointment and the attachment associated with striving for the perfect Mormon dream just creates suffering for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think my heart right now is, uh, I don't know. I talk about my heart a lot, but just like, Just thinking of like you, you guys, um, your sister's husband, um, your brother's wife, ex-wife, um, and like you we're taught 
to um, like grieve with those that grieve and like um, what's the saying? Mourn with those who mourn. Thank you. Mourn the, with those that mourn, and we're taught all these lessons growing up in the LDS faith of like embracing people and loving people. And I'm thinking of the scapegoats within this family and how like even your brother-in-law losing his wife and then having that on top of it, mm-hmm. <laughs> like having that scapegoat on top of it. Mm-hmm. And then I'm thinking of your sister-in-law and how <laughs> devastating, because I know how just I felt during my faith crisis alone mm-hmm. and having that shattering feeling. <laughs> And then having on top of it, like not being able to have children. Mm-hmm. And then having on top of that, mm-hmm. a husband that says, you're not enough mm-hmm. and leaving. Mm-hmm. And um, instead of being embraced and loved, and even worthy of trying I don't know I I guess I'm like my heart is a little bit going to those people and you that were the were the scapegoats were the you know when they're hurting then have a smear campaign on top of it and um, maybe what their stories are. So I'm glad I get to hear yours today. Um, Cause I'm sure that they have a story too. That is um, really hard. And uh, even though it's hard, I'm glad that you're here telling it because I think it's really important for um, thank you people who need to connect with that and kind of hear that. So thank you for being here and telling this, even though it's hard. Thank you. It's, yeah, it was, it, it was really, you know, just really hard to, all of that was, you know, but the thing is, yeah, I, I, and I went through that and that's, and, and the thing is, and I will talk about that in a second, but I want to touch on to just like, my mom told me things about my brother-in-law. She reinforced it. And just like when you had, and I had questions. I had questions. A lot of things didn't make sense. And with my sister-in-law, a lot of things didn't make sense. And I would ask questions, but I was never allowed to have my own thoughts. It was always redirected to her. And it's just like the church, you have questions, but you're always redirected to the source, redirected to church talks, whatever the church says is, whatever my mom said was. And so I am not innocent in A, the, the killing of my sister, the suicide of my sister, because I believed my mom. And I believed and. I'm not innocent in even part of the smear campaign against my brother-in-law because I had no real reason to not believe my mother. I didn't. Why would my mom lie to me? And so I assisted in that smear campaign. I assisted in it, and those are called in narcissistic families flying monkeys is what they're called. They only exist to serve the source. And I was a flying monkey. I, I was return and report. What can you find out? Return and report. And I was actually, I was good friends with my brother-in-law's wife when he got married. And I, I was the only one who was close to my sibling, to my sister's kids. And, and even though I tried, I, was, I still had her eyes on. That makes sense. And so I was never safe for them, but I didn't know it. 
And I was always trying to redirect them to my family. Like, just like the church, you're like, we're good. We're good people. And I was always trying to redirect my, ch- my, my nieces and nephews and, my, and say, we're good. Come on, we're good. Look at all the good things. We're good people. Don't be afraid of us. But the thing is, they knew. They knew. They were caught by a parachute. <laughs> they were caught by, they were at this point already outsiders, aunts and uncles, already outsiders, who had caught my brother-in-law and wrapped them up and said, okay, this is a thing. Let me tell you what's going on here. It's kind of like the ex-Mormon group. There is my ex-family group <laughs> who catches those outsiders. And I was an insider. I was a, I tried to toe the line. I was nuanced in my family. I was like, we can have it all. <laughs> I can, you know, we can be one big happy family. And eventually I was kicked out. Eventually it happened. So... You can't have it both ways in a family like that. I think it's really special that you're acknowledging that you played a part. Like I, I've I've been a witness to these dynamics, and oftentimes the kids involved are victims in a sense, because there are going to be some who really try and hustle and play the game, mm-hmm. and they're going to be more successful, and there's going to be others that just don't want to play the game. Or they try and they fail. Mm -hmm. And then, and it's easy for those who don't try to play the game or who fail to have resentment Mm -hmm. for the ones who are successful. Mm -hmm. And it divides, it divides the family members in really, really dark, Mm -hmm. toxic ways. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to hate the one that's succeeding Mm -hmm. because you kind of, you kind of blame them for being the goody goody or being two faced or being, um, you know, being a suck up or whatever it is. But the truth is everybody's suffering. Even the person, well, nobody's safe. Mm-hmm. And even the person that's perceived as winning the favor mm-hmm. is probably losing. Yeah, you're never safe in these systems. You're, it only, for me, it took days, maybe maybe a week. I don't know, before I was, I fell from, fell from grace. It was just like, yeah. It happens so fast. Yeah. And, you know, if we hop back into the timeline of with my, you know, my first, the first divorce, that kind of, you know, I started to deconstruct just a little bit. I started to wonder if certain things, and this was in, in pandemic, we weren't going to church anyway, but I started to see shoulders <laughs> And I was like, why is it so, why can't we show our shoulders? Like, it was so silly. And I started to just kind of, Adam was privy to a lot of these rants of mine, like, I can't show my shoulders. Why can't I? And he'd always say, but you can. I'm like, but no, I can't. (laughs) Here, the nuanced husband is like, but you can. I'm like, no, but I can't. (laughs) I can't. You don't, I can't. They'll know. They will know if, if I don't wear my garments, they will know I'm asking questions. They will know, and um, and that so that was you know I was starting to just kind of peel away some layers a little bit here and there, but I wasn't questioning doctrine. I was just questioning, like why are we doing this? Why are we divorcing people because they don't believe the same as we do? Why are we doing? Why can't we? Why can't we do these little things? They don't matter. These things don't matter. If there's a loving God, why does he care about that so much? Like I started, that was really the only thing that I had on my shelf as I knew it. And I didn't even know what to call it. Um, But um, then a couple months later, another brother announced a divorce. And he'd only been married to his uh, wife a year. It was a new one. A new one. A new brother. And at this point, I was like, holy moly. Like, I, even though I really didn't get involved in that other one, it mentally and spiritually and everything, it threw me for a loop. Okay? And so I was like, I'm just going to say I'm so sorry to my brother and say, I'm so sorry. That must be so hard. And I did. In the family group text, he 
did it in the family. He announced his divorce in the family group text. And um, sorry, my tongue is like a million times <laughs> bigger than a normal tongue should be. But um, I, um, but I texted him that, and then I just remember, you know, see, now I am his only older sister. Our other sister is not with us, and and I. I have had to assume that role of older sister, and it's been really hard for me because it's that's just been really hard for me. But I, I had this thought, you know, I went for a run and and I thought, you're his older sister. You need to listen to him. And so I texted him and I said, if you need me to listen to you, I'll listen to you. If we need to talk, I'm here. And so we did, and he told me just about a very difficult marriage. And he, he was, I felt like he was very honest in telling me things. Um, he told me about specific things that I don't, I'm not going to go into because I, it's not, that was not my marriage. But he told me about some things, and he admitted to some things that he had done, and and um, that, but as I listened to him, and I hear I didn't say anything other than that seems very hard. I had this thought, and now we're, I can't explain where it comes from, what it was, but I had this thought: there's more to the story that you need to be opened up to, and. Whatever it was, it was. And I, I remember Adam was there because we were at a park, and I, he asked me how it went, the conversation. I said, I think there's more to the story. And, but the thing is, I had no intentions of finding the more to the story. Like, it was none of my business, and it was just kind of one of these things, like, that was strange. And so, like, an hour or so later... I get a text from my sister-in-law, this one, you know, with this particular brother, and she almost verbatim, <laughs> those words were, would you be open to hearing my story? And I didn't even have her name in my phone. Um, this is how we weren't close. She stayed at my house a couple of times, but we were so far apart in age, and they had only been married a year that I, I didn't have her name in my phone, and I had to scroll up to the top to see who it was, because I had another text message from her, and it was just the date said, you know, and she had thanked me for letting me stay, letting her stay at my home, and, and then I thought, okay, that's her. I know who this is, and I, so that, just to give context, I wasn't involved in their life, um, and I had to say yes. I had to say yes because however it worked, I had to say yes. And so I did. And I ended up talking to her a few days later. And again, I just listened to her, and it was just that more to the story. And the thing, the difference between the two conversations was she was very honest in the part she played in the marriage where my brother was more blamey about her and sh- and and anyway it just there was more to the story and there was abuse in this marriage and i just listened and i was so sad for the two of them i loved them both and i just remember being so sad for my brother while i was listening here and then my and then at the end of the conversation, she, um, she asked me a question that I was not prepared to answer. She said, she asked me if my dad was abusive. And I was, I knew at that moment that it was, I was, I had to either acknowledge her or make her feel crazy. I had to, I had to acknowledge the abuse in my that I endured as a child. And I never had before to a person of consequence. 
All I said was no, but my mom was very hard. That's all I said. And I knew, like, at that second, I could feel the universe shift, however that worked. It's like, this is going to change everything. I said it out loud. And and I didn't know what to do. It's almost like when you grow up in, in that type of a system, there is fear, so much fear. I kind of explain it as the very air you breathe has ears. I was afraid that my mom would find out that I said it out loud. And I also knew that I needed to act. That once I said it, I needed to act. I needed to help. And so I drove down that very night. I drove to my where the town my parents live in, and I, and I, it was like at 4 a.m. I got Adam up in the morning, and I said, I have to go. I have to help. We're hurting people. This has to stop. And I didn't want anybody else to get hurt. And so I drove down, and I met my dad at a trail. And I said, I just need to walk, and I need to talk with you, and I need you to listen. This was not the first time I opened up to my dad about abuse, but this was the time I was going to make him listen. (laughs) And so I, I told him what I had heard and that I was so sad and I wanted to help and I loved my brothers and I just wanted us to, we needed help, we needed to fix this. And, and then I opened up about the abuse and things that my mom did. Um, just, you know, very little, and I was so scared. But he acknowledged it. He acknowledged that things were hard. <laughs> and he, he just, you know, he, he, but then he blamed himself, and he said it was because he wasn't a good enough provider. And he said that my mom had lived a stressful life because he didn't make enough money and all of those things, and, and, and I just said, you know, and, and, then, and I tried, anyway, I just, it was such a, that conversation was, you know, but then he, he reassured me. He said, you need to forgive your mom, and you need to look at all of the good things she's doing, and I'll take care of it. I'll take care of your brothers. I'll take care of it. <laughs> and so, I, again, I thought I did my part. I did my part and I left very, things are gonna be okay, our family's going to get better. And I was so happy. And, but it didn't take but a few days for it to all start to crumble. I say I went for help and I left with the target on my back. Um, so, um, sorry, it's kind of hard to talk about, you know, (sighs) so I, um, I just remember, you know, I was just kind of going about my day and it was Mother's Day, I remember it was Mother's Day last year, um, I, I mean, I'm a writer. I, I wrote a Mother's Day article, and it was just so funny, funny article and and stuff. And it came, and, and and it was just I don't like Mother's Day and whatever. And 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 I remember them this a lady messaging me, and actually it kind of triggered her a little bit. And she said that she had an abusive mother, and I didn't talk about that. But again, that I opened up to this lady. I said, I know. I said, I again to a second person of consequence. And it was my story was getting louder. And I was starting to see life the way it really was. So that Mother's Day, um, I didn't, we didn't go to church. Um, and my, uh, but I knew I, I was having a really hard time because I didn't want to acknowledge her, my mom. 
I just was having a hard day. And my dad texted me and he said, uh, he said, why don't, like, but I did. I did end up texting my mom a happy Mother's Day. And I actually got on the family Zoom call and I said, happy Mother's Day. And it was really hard for me. But my dad texted me and said, why don't you acknowledge your mother on Mother's Day? And I was like, what? You know that I'm having a hard time. Um, I didn't say that. I didn't talk back to him. I, I ended up texting my mom again another Happy Mother's Day because I was like, I, I need to do this. I need to earn favor back. So I did. I three acknowledgments that day. And then I the next day, but I felt like, what happened? Why, why am I getting called out? And I remember te- calling my sister and saying, what did you do for Mother's Day? Did you do something? And she said, no, I just, just said Happy Mother's Day. And, and then I, I broke down and I told her what happened. I thought she was safe. I, I told her what happened. I was just, this, you know, I, you know and, and told her about you know, what I had learned with my brother and the, our brother. And then it was after that when things started to just come at me. I had brother, they were blocking me, they were telling people not to listen to me, that I was, I was uh, attacking my parents, I was saying things, I was spreading lies, I was doing all of these things that I wasn't doing. I hadn't done anything, but as suddenly I was on the blocker, block her, don't talk to her, she is not safe, don't talk to her, she's saying things, and I didn't know what to do. And so um, there was actually, you know, a Facebook message that was put out where my mom says something about circling the wagons. It's one of those Mormon things is you circle the wagons. And she equated it to we needed to support my brothers. They were under attack. And we needed to circle the wagons. And that's like Mormon pioneer stuff, like when the Native Americans, you know, they would circle the wagons to defend from army, from enemy people. And, and it was, it was a, say, telling me that I needed to be one of them, that I was not supporting my, my brothers. And so this, this smear campaign was happening. It was in full force. And I, I didn't know what to do. It, that was really a dark, dark time for me because like my older sister, I went to my dad for help and I left um, with the opposite. I and I, it got really dark because I had nowhere to go. I had nowhere. All of my, I mean, they call it poisoning the well is another narcissistic term is where they make up they exhaust all your lifelines. I didn't have my dad, I didn't have my mom, I didn't have my siblings. Um, I had nowhere to go. Um, but then I ended up, he was out of town and I was dark, it was dark. I, I was where my sister was. I remember walking with my, my baby down the street and I just wanted the road to end because I had nowhere to go. And it was all my fault. I did this. It was all because I, but I knew I didn't lie, but I couldn't fix it. I said too much. I couldn't fix it. And, and so, but I went to an aunt that lived nearby, and I just, I, I felt like for some reason she would be safe. I didn't know, she was an outsider too. She was like, you know, I started to look to the outsiders, <laughs> the other discarded family members that I was estranged from. I'm one of them now. And then I learned about a lot of lies. I, my, I have an older brother who's been out for a long time, also discarded, but I didn't, I didn't like him because I was bred. I was, I couldn't like him. And I, you know, and there were a lot of things 
we were told that he had stolen money, that he had done a lot of things, and none of it was true. And as I started to deconstruct my family, I was, you know, I was in this world of what is true. My whole life was a lie. The people that I hated, I hated for no reason. And, and I was being hated for no reason, you know? And, and so it was as simple as, if they can lie, I can show my shoulders. If they can lie, I, you know, it was just all of those things. That was it. I was like, I am not them. And it was, I don't want to go to their heaven. That was it. They're temple going people, hold high callings, but I did not want to go to their heaven. And so I started to step back and I was having that faith crisis of, just, I don't want to go to church. It wasn't that I didn't believe in it. It's like, I don't need to follow your rules. I can show my shoulders. And isn't that silly? <laughs> you know? But I remember, so Adam ended up saying something to his mom about that I was having a faith crisis. And, and she asked if it was about church history. And... I wasn't. It wasn't about church history. And that topic seemed to just keep coming up. She brought up, she's like, did she read the CES letter? Hmm. And I was like, I didn't, this is how, I didn't even know what CES stood for, <laughs> let alone what the CES letter was. And because I was so indoctrinated, I was not going to read that thing. Like, I was, it was church approved. Church approved is all I would read. And then a friend of mine, like, I, he, he's an author. He, re, he wrote the books. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, Stronger Than the Dark. His name's Corey Reese. He's an ultra runner, and he talks oh, yeah. about his yeah. faith crisis. Yeah. And I read that book as just kind of my only outside. It was my rebellious I'm going to, like, because I knew that book was there and I knew he had left the church, but I put it on that do not read list because <laughs> it was faith shaking. Um, but I read that book and it resonated with me a lot. And then, so he said he started with the essays. That's all he said. And here's an interesting story about, co about this man was when I, when he announced that he, was leaving the church, I messaged him and told him to read the Book of Mormon again. <laughs> I did. I did. And I chastised him. I was like, you know, what, what's wrong with you? Why would you leave this thing? And so I ended up, you know, apologizing to him and everything. But I read the essays, and this time without the apologetic mind, because I had read some, and I was like, you know, very apologetic myself. Um, but I read, I read them without the apologetic mind, and I, and I read them all. And I got to the book of Abraham, and we were, in the, we were driving, and I just remember feeling like I was falling into the bottom of the car. Like, I was like, this is not okay. This is not true. This is not true. You can't change words. You can't say translation means one thing and it doesn't mean another thing. And, and you can't. Like, this is not okay. I was not taught this. Again, I felt, I started to feel betrayed. It's like, they lied. This is a lie. This is not what I was taught. And then I gave myself permission to read the CES letter. And I read it. And one day, I ingested the whole thing. And I, it was, that was the end for me. And as I read that, I, you know, I saw Jeremy Runnels as a person like me who went to a family member with questions and 
was essentially excommunicated for asking questions and speaking out. And I saw myself in that. And in the whole, there's a, there is even a branch in the church that talks about that, how there's a branch, a kind of a smear campaign, you know, where they can dig up dirt about people. And it happened to him. And it happened to my family. I was excommunicated from my family for speaking out against abuse and asking questions. And he was excommunicated from the church for doing the same thing. And so I was reading my life story as I was reading that. And that's when I started to learn more. And I started to see that the Mormon church was a cult and my family was a cult within that cult. And that's kind of where I started to make a lot of connections and started to just learn and unlearn. So. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna ask about that, whether to what extent I mean with the you know, not allowed to criticize mm -hmm. your mom or the church. Mm -hmm. And then when you do criticize, you kind of break the unpardonable rule. Mm -hmm. And then everybody gossiping, mm -hmm. everybody making up stories and judging you unfairly, mm -hmm. and then ultimately kicking you out. Mm -hmm. There's some, some yeah. parallels there. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> parallels were there. And, and the thing is, as I learned, read about Joseph Smith, and I learned about the beginnings of the church, and I learned about him. I started reading No Man Knows My History. I'm still not done with it. I don't have a lot of time, but I, I got through a lot of it, but I started to learn about this thing. And I, I, I'm in therapy, Adam. Thankfully, Adam got me in, because as a daughter of a therapist, I was terrified to seek any help. Um, we, were, we were conditioned to believe that only people who didn't, my dad said, anyone who, a woman who doesn't have a, a woman who doesn't have a supportive husband needs therapy. And so, and that he was supposed to be my therapist. And he couldn't be my therapist. And so he, I wore him down. And so he finally got me into therapy. <laughs> he had to make the appointment because I was terrified. Um, but I, this therapist, she was hearing my story and she, she told me I needed to look up narcissistic families. And so, and I was extremely hesitant I did not like the word narcissism. It was used, um, my mom called my brother-in-law a narcissist. And in my mind, I knew that my mom was very similar to what she was saying this brother-in-law was, but I wasn't ready to admit it. I would say it a couple times to Adam. Um, but I rejected labels, and I was taught to reject labels, too. I was taught. My dad didn't even like the word depression. My mom didn't like the word depression. Um, we, didn't, we didn't call anything that. Um, and so for a therapist to tell me that I needed to research narcissism and narcissistic families, it took me a long time because I was like, I know what I'm experiencing, but I'm not going to name it anything. But as it started to get worse, and as you know, the smear campaign thickened, I said, I need, to learn. I need to learn. I need to learn what this is so I can better defend myself. Um, so yeah, I, I started to learn about Joseph Smith and, and just the things that, the grandiose sense, the sense of self, the, you know, the huge, you know, bigger than life persona, but you know, and he's a martyr, he died a martyr you know, those types of things. And that is something key in narcissism, is martyrdom. Is they're either the victim or the hero, you know? 
they're never the villain in the story. And so... Um, I just have to say, like, I, I, I kind of want to... This, this may be off-putting or offensive to believers, yeah. but I kind of want to read the list of narcissistic traits again mm -hmm. with Joseph Smith in mind yeah. and just see if any of them check out based on what we know about them. I'll go quick. An exaggerated sense of self-importance, sense of entitlement, and require constant excessive admiration. I'm thinking of his time in Nauvoo where he's mayor and chief judge and prophet and head of the legion, the songs we sing to him. Mm -hmm. Expect to be recognized as superior even without achievements that warrant it. I mean, if the stuff he said were true, it was warranted. Mm -hmm. The question was, is the stuff he said true? Mm -hmm. Exaggerate achievements and talents. I mean, that's the first vision, right? That's all of the scriptures he claimed to quote, translate. Mm -hmm. Be preoccupied with fantasies about success, power, brilliance, beauty. Believe they are superior and can only associate with equally special people. Monopolize, com monopolize conversations and belittle or look down on people as they perceive inferior. I mean, the whole church was set up as the one true church and God's chosen people, which leaves everybody else as inferior. Mm -hmm. in, you know, superior people, everyone else yeah. is inferior. I mean, that's how I grew up. Mormons are better yeah. than everybody yeah. else. Mm -hmm. And that's how I think a narcissistic family mm -hmm. system operates. That's how that works. Take advantage of others to get what they want. Martin Harris, mm -hmm. first witnesses, like long list of people have an inability or unwillingness to recognize the needs and feelings of other others. There's a question about, you know, was there proper concern for the people that are getting hurt? Be envious of others and believe others envy them. Be being arrogant or haughty, conceited, boastful, pretentious. Insist on having the best of everything. And then becoming angry when you don't get special treatment, mm -hmm. having interpersonal problems, feeling slighted, reacting with anger, difficulty regulating emotion, yeah. um, insecurity, secret insecurity. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, I don't know enough about Joseph Smith, but it is a common question to ask whether he would meet criteria for narcissistic personality disorder. So, yeah. Well, then, <laughs> I'm not going to diagnose it. Yeah, I wouldn't either. And you wouldn't either, but, yeah. you know, people can yeah. now kind of have those in mind to think about it. Yeah, and I'm not even here to diagnose my, my mom. It's more just looking at the system and how it worked and how it functioned and how the church also functions on that same premise, on that same, you know, you have within the, the organization itself, Okay, you have a prophet who is the seer, okay? And if you, you, we hear the word seer, but we don't realize it's seer. Seer is seer. A prophet is, a, is the one who sees for everybody else. And you are only, you see through the prophet's eyes. Okay, and then you have, you have your, you know, kind of your enablers, the apologists, you know, all those things. You have the favorite child. You have those, the, the really, really faithful, faithful members. And then, you know, you have those, you know, who just kind of are quiet, kind of the nuance. And then you have the ones who are like, wait a second. You know, I got some questions here, you know. And, and those end up being your scapegoats. And that isn't even, that's embedded in the Mormon doctrine, in just the Book of Mormon itself. Okay, you think of uh, Nephi, Lehi. That family is a narcissistic family. You've got Lehi, who is the family seer. You've got Sariah, who is the enabling wife, who just goes along, you know. The, and then you've got Nephi, who's the favorite child, I will go and do. You've got Sam, who's just kind of there, the gray rock. And you've got Laman and Lemuel, who are the scapegoats. And whether you believe the Book of Mormon is true or not, 
that is the family model. You can say that, you know, that family is the first family of, of the book of, of, you know, of Mormonism. That is a dysfunctional family. That is not the way families should be. <laughs> and Nephi's like, I being great in stature, having yeah. being favorite of my fair mm -hmm. parents from my young yeah. years. Like he's, <laughs> he's kind of shown some narcissistic mm -hmm. traits, right? Yeah. As well. Mm -hmm. Carrying, maybe carrying on. Yeah. Toxicity. And so, yeah. But the thing is, when, when somebody leaves the church, it's par for the course. It's like, you're layman, you're Lemuel. We know this story, you know? And so it doesn't, it doesn't ruffle a lot of these true believers. They're like, well, you're just, you're just doing that. But that is not healthy in the family system. You need to allow for differentiation. People, you know, you need to allow people to be individuals. And, you know, yeah, it's hard. Mm. There's so much. My mind is, is going so many different places. <laughs> well, I mean, those who know, you know, those who have tried to piece together how the Book of Mormon was created mm -hmm. will know that one of the main sources of the Book of Mormon story is Joseph Smith's own personal mm -hmm. family biography. Exactly. And so it's not just that Lehi, <laughs> Lehi's family fits the model of a narcissistic family. It's that Lehi's family was modeled after Joseph Smith's. Mm -hmm. It's it's basically Joseph Smith's biography. It's exactly. It's Joseph exactly. Smith's family, mm -hmm. and so it starts with Joseph Smith's family. Mm -hmm. Probably starts with his parents. Mm -hmm. He becomes the favored son. He replicates that into the Book of Mormon, mm -hmm. but then he replicates it into a church structure mm -hmm. that then we all we all become victims of because then not only does the church replicate the narcissistic family system. But then that becomes the model mm -hmm. of interpersonal relationships mm -hmm. for individual families across multiple generations. Right, it does, and it, it's the abuse cycle. It's not the, it is the pride cycle, it's the abuse cycle. And, and it's just, yeah, and as I read a little bit of No Man Knows My History, I started to, things started to make sense. And, and, you know, that he did project his own family into that story. And he took um, the whole, it's, as I see it, a fan fiction of different, you know, you have this from the book of Hebrews. He brought that in. And then you have um, just the whole, the times, you know, the speculation, you know, speculative things from the times and what they thought Native Americans, how they came here and all of those the mound things. Builder myth. The mound builder myth and yeah. all of those things. And the thing about narcissists is they are high, high, high on speculative thought. So much on drawing conclusions based on a limited amount of information. And, and it always serves to fit their mold, their own narrative. It always, you know, it always, you know, they say this happened and this happened, so this must have happened. You know, I, you know, as an example with my, our son, oldest son who didn't serve, it was, you know, I was trying to, I didn't want my parents to tell my young, my sons that they needed to serve mission. So I set kind of a boundary there when a while back but there was like a conversation where I, I told my, my dad that he was not to not to push my son to go on a mission. And in another conversation, we talked about how we spent a lot on club soccer. You know, he drew those two. He's mushed those together, <laughs> and we weren't going to let him go on a mission because we spent too much on club soccer. So it's just like the high. They're high on speculative thought. They're high on drawing conclusions to fit their narrative. I hope that makes sense, mm -hmm. but that's just a common theme, and that's what, you know, Joseph Smith was very speculative in what he perceived, you know, they all were at the time, Oh, and when he put that all into the story and stuff. That makes yeah, sense. I'm thinking about the LDS discussion series that we've been doing and how Mike noted how bold it was for Joseph Smith to write himself into the Book of Mormon mm -hmm. 
where he's like, mm -hmm. and behold, there shall be a seer who shall come forth <laughs> and he'll share the name of his own father <laughs> and he shall be called Joseph, whatever it is, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that takes a lot. I mean, unless it's true, mm -hmm. that takes a lot of, um, <laughs> you have to think a lot of yourself mm -hmm. to, you're going to not only make up scripture, but you're going to write yourself into the scripture, prophesy about yourself posthumously. And then um, I'm also thinking of the quote that was mentioned, I think, in our episode last week with the growing up in polygamy, where Joseph Smith says, even Jesus couldn't do it, I did. You know, even Jesus couldn't keep a church together, yeah. but I did. It's in the church history book. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he says, yeah. <laughs> it's like Jesus couldn't even do it, but I did. Yeah. Yeah. That's a hard, that's a hard one. Yeah. yeah to look past. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it's just, you know, and I, sorry, sometimes people don't tell you how hard it is to talk in podcasts and not get tired of yourself, <laughs> hearing yourself Are talk. Are you tired? Not getting tired of hearing yourself talk oh. and getting tired. Oh. They don't warn you ahead yeah. of time. That it's exhausting. It's kind of exhausting. This exhausting. <laughs> you exhausted, Jen? No, but I, I want to hear our story, story so bad. So. Yeah. So. so you have this big faith crisis. Mm -hmm. That's just going to be another shoe to drop for you. I mean, not only now... Have you criticized your mom and been flagged as dangerous? Mm -hmm. And now the now all the your siblings are attacking you and siding with her, and you're the enemy. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to lose your faith crisis. Now, uh, sorry, yeah. now you're going to have a faith crisis and lose your faith. It happened all in the <laughs> same time. It was all at the same time. Just. I lost my faith and my family at the same exact time. I lost everything. I just, and it was so hard because to, and the thing is, it needed to happen in this order. It really did. As awful as it was, there was no way I was going to leave the church ever. Like, I was trying to earn favor. Even though I had some questions, I was, I was in it. But because I lost my family, it gave me permission to ask questions about other things because I didn't have them hanging over my head. I didn't have that. I knew I was gone. I was dead to them. I was done. They were, they were done with me. And so... I needed it to happen in that order, and it did. But, and thankfully, I knew because I had asked that, I had asked Adam if he would leave me. I knew I wouldn't lose him. I knew I still had my my husband, and that part was going to be okay, you know. But I remember the like. I don't think I did it right. I just did it. But I said, it's not true. I was as bold to say, this is not true. It's not true to my kids, even. What's not true? The church. They knew, they, they were there for the whole family stuff, and it was really hard on us, and I wish I, could, I wish I could have hidden it from them. But it was so detrimental that there is no hiding from my kids that mom is not okay, and we are not seeing the family anymore. And, and yeah, that was you hard. You cut yourself off? I cut myself off from my family. <sighs> yes and, and no. The thing, what happened was, um, and I'm, it's hard. There's so many little parts yeah, to my course. story. Of course. That um, so essentially, when I when I started to learn things that were not true, what my mom has said, I confronted her, and then she lied to me about things I never did. And, and that's when I knew this was bigger than me. Is, this, is gaslighting a term that's appropriate here? Yes, it's very much. And, the, and gaslighting is another one of those terms that's thrown around a you lot. You said lying. I mean, there's a, you've been physically abused, mm -hmm. you know, like people ganging up against you. There's psychological abuse. Mm -hmm. You said the lying mm -hmm. was the hardest part. Mm -hmm. is it, does that go hand in hand with gaslighting for you? You know, gaslighting is a difficult thing to define. 
Um, Because I I read something actually recently, because people have been throwing that word around a lot. Gaslighting does not mean when somebody disagrees with you, they're not gaslighting you, you're really just having a disagreement. But gaslighting is when they distort your reality and they throw you off balance and they throw it on you and say, you know, and you, it's just a whole reality distorting thing. And, and that's what that is. And it's, 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 not, it's hard for me to define. I'm still trying to figure that out. That's why I have a hard time using terms because I still don't quite understand what, what the terms mean, but I know what I experienced. And I know, so maybe if somebody's watching, they can define it better than me. Yeah, and I'm not trying to inject that, (laughs) but I do want to say that if they're telling you things that happened that didn't happen, Mm -hmm. or they're telling you that things didn't happen that you know happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that what that is? I mean, the way I would think of that is is potentially trying to distort your reality. Yeah, so that's what that was. And so... As, you know, she had these made-up stories in her head that, like, so it's interesting. They put you, like, it's like this happened, but this didn't happen. For instance, she told me that I, she had run a race for me one time because, I I don't know, her and my dad did something. Anyway, I had them run a race for me so I can get into another race. Anyway, and she has some race photos from the race. And I remember her showing me the race photos. And I remember that being that, but she told me, she said, remember when I ran that race for you? Um, You looked at at that picture and you said, look at yourself. And she told me that I told her that she needed to lose 50 pounds. Like, what? And they project their own insecurities onto their children. That never happened. I would have never said that to a single person, let alone my own mother. I re- and so what they do is they, they put you in, you're there, but that didn't happen. And so it, it does distort your reality because you're like, I remember that, but that didn't happen. You know? and, and I equate it to even like my four-year-old, he'll be, <laughs> they think they can read minds. <laughs> they do. And I, I laugh because it's funny when my four-year-old does it, but it's not funny when an adult does it. You know, he'll, he'll say, you're, you're mad at me, or you think I'm this, or you're whatever. I'm like, no, I don't. You don't know what I'm thinking. But narcissists, they project their insecurities onto people, and they believe it. And she did that to me, and it throws you way off balance. And, and when I confronted her, I was, I was angry. I was very angry because I had gotten home from a run and I was terrified. I was terrified because she had taken my dad from me, she had taken my siblings from me, and I was not going to let her have my children. And I said those things to her on the phone call. And then I, and, and I was scared because it wasn't that she was going to abuse my children. It was that she was going to love on them to death, and then she was going to turn them against me. And I knew it. I knew it was going to happen. They kill people with kindness. The church slowly kills people with kindness. It's the light, the world. It's the look at all of the good things we're doing. We're this good system. And then they get you in and then you're stuck, and then you see the world the way they are conditioning you to see it. There's only one way to see the world. Yes, through the seer's eyes. And with my own siblings, she turned them against me because she she gave them a set of eyes to see me with, and they will only see me the way she sees me. And I know how that works because I only saw my older brother the way she saw him until I removed those eyes, into those, I, until I took it off. And I saw him with my own eyes. But I had to put a stop to it. And I, I said, you do not get to have my children. And then 
one thing led to another, and the smear camp campaign got worse. And um, I had a brother who returned home from a mission, and I couldn't, I couldn't go to it because I couldn't be around them. It was not safe for me. And he started saying things to me like that I lied about something, and then, and he he told me that I was spreading lies about my mom, saying that she was abusive, and things about my brothers, and and I didn't know where that was coming from. And I said, "What are you saying?" Because I haven't. I at the point, and I had only talked to Adam. I talked to my dad, and I talked to my younger sister. Those are the only three people I had talked to about this. And, and then he said, check your Facebook Messenger. I'm like, what? What do you mean, check my Facebook Messenger? And then he had yelled at me a lot, that conversation, and had blamed me for a lot of things in his childhood that I had done. I don't know. I didn't see him very much. I'm a lot older than he is. Um, but then my dad hopped on the phone, and he said, he read this message, and I talked about it earlier, he read this message that I had sent to a woman after I'd written that Mother's Day article, and just where I said, yes, I, I grew up in an abusive household too, and the cycle's hard to break. My dad read that message to me, and he said, did you, are these your words? And I said, yes, I wrote that. How did you get it? I didn't deny it. He said, yeah, those are my words. And at that point, I couldn't remember the conversation I had with this woman. It was so inconsequential to me, honestly. I couldn't remember. And then he, he told me, he said, searching for that is fruitless. He said, you don't need to find where I got it but are you sorry for what you said? You know, and, and I was not going to let him do that. I said, I want to know who said that and how you got that message. And so I actually reached out to this lady. And I said, I'm sorry, I, why did you share that with my family? Like, I was operating on the assumption that she shared this with my family. Because my dad had said something to the effect that my mom was getting these, uh, had gotten a, a letter from somebody that she had gotten a letter saying this stuff and and so I was thinking that this lady wrote a letter to my family and, and all of this stuff and she said I'm sorry I don't know your family I didn't do anything and I'm like how did they get that message and again I had a thought and and again I can't explain it but it, the words in my head said check your Facebook activity and I did. I didn't know what that even meant. I hadn't been on Facebook in a long time. And I checked it, and I saw all of these IP addresses, these logins into my account. And, and then again, the words are, check those IP addresses. I didn't know you could check IP addresses. I copied and pasted the IP addresses, one after one, into the search thing, and it pinged in the town my parents live in several times a day for several days. I screenshotted it and I sent it to my dad. I said, she got into my Facebook account and she shared that message and he texted back. He said, what are you gonna get? What are you gonna do, turn me in? And he took the blame for it. I know it wasn't him, but he took the blame for it. And I, um, from then, I had this conversation, but he knew Right after he texted that, he called me. It's like he had admitted to a crime. Um, and then that's he, illegal? Yeah, it's, it's, well, to get into somebody's Facebook account, is, I mean, I even looked it up. It's not, it's not legal to get into somebody else's Facebook account. Whether it is or whether it isn't, it's not right. Yeah. Okay. And so, and the thing is, like, again, he blamed me because of the things that I said. He's like, does that... Does that th um, negate your apology for apologizing for the things you said? And I, but the things I said were true. She was abusive. And even he acknowledged it in our walk. And then he blamed me for 
him having access to my Facebook account because a year and a half earlier, my, I had gotten into an argument with my older brother, something that they encouraged, my parents encouraged it, and they told me how my brother was jealous of me and, and that I was right and he was wrong, and again, pitting us against each other. And my mom asked for my Facebook password because she wanted to read the conversation to see to help me. And so she I did give her my password like a year and a half earlier. She held on to that and then she got in, but my so it, she didn't hack into it, but she did get into my Facebook account and she took that message and shared it without context to my siblings. And therefore that fueled her smear campaign against me. And so I told my dad, I said, this is not a father-daughter conversation. What you did was wrong. And I said, this is not okay. And I told him how much I missed him. And I told him I missed, I missed a lot of things about him. He was my first running partner. He was my... He was my dad. I, I idolized my dad. He was my only safe place. And I told him, sorry, I told him how much I missed him. And he said, you don't miss me. You miss that version of me. And then I told him, I said, you, we can't, I said, you were lying. You lie. Why do you lie? Why are you lying? Because I learned about my, 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 about my older brother, and I talked about that, and he said, he said, everybody lies. And then he told me about a, uh, an article I had written about my sister dying, you know, when, when she was taken, you know, by life flight um, after she, um, anyway, and I, that I had written that it was a helicopter, and he said, he said it actually was an airplane. He said it was a helicopter. And I said, I'm sorry, that wasn't a lie. Thanks for the clarification. I won't say it again, but I, it was just one of those scenes, again, gaslighting, trying to throw me off balance and trying to call me a liar. I said, I'm not a liar. I don't lie. This is not okay. And I said, I can't have my children around people who do this. And I, I didn't want to say that because I didn't want to keep my children away, but I, it was not safe. It wasn't safe. They were going to poison my children. This was not okay. And he said, that's your choice. And he said, I have life jackets in my boat that belong to you. Do you want me to mail them to you? That was the last thing he said to me. That's the discard. And you're saying he cut you off as his child? Mm -hmm. But he can say that I cut him off. But I had to protect my children. So but after that conversation, he's texting me, do you want to take the boat out next weekend? It was just like very Weird to have that, you know, to text me right after this conversation, a day or so after, you know, and I just like, you did not just have this conversation. Um, and then I had to yeah. kind of confront him in a phone call. And I just told him kind of the same thing that just he, he she wants a dad, she wants to be with you and, and that and the conversation went okay. But then I was cut off from that all of a sudden because they blocked her a month or two before me. For a month, I mean, a while. Then they blocked me from everything, phone, everything. I was then cut off because then I started to, I wasn't what they wanted me to be. Yeah. So. And I've seen families split their own children from their spouses and mm -hmm. keep the in-law in the family mm -hmm. and actually encouraging divorce to cut off the, the blood relative. There's, you know what that's called? When you say pitting against each other, it, the narcissistic term is triangulation. 
He was trying, is you get them alone and you try to feed them your narrative. So they will, they will go against that other person. And that's what my dad was doing, was triangulating. And so, but the church does that as well. The church triangulates, you know, and, you know, and, and cults do that. You know, if you can get somebody isolated by themselves, you can, you can feed them, you know, but you, but you can feed them what you want to feed them if you can get them alone and villainize other things. It's all, it's what it is. It's triangulation. <laughs> and so my dad was trying to do that to him. Because up until now, the predominant, I don't want to say villain, that's a really bad word, but the predominant villain in the narrative in my mind has been your mom. Mm -hmm. But your dad's, your account of your dad's behavior, I mean, it's not your mom cutting you off, it's your dad. Now, of course, there's the idea that your mom's the puppeteer, your dad's the marionette or the puppet, mm -hmm. but your dad's not sounding super great right now either. And maybe that's, he's also a bad actor or maybe he's a victim in a bad system. We've been trying to figure that out. To figure that out. <laughs> we don't, cause it's, He's been so good to us. It's been very it's hard. It's been to very that. hard for it to have that to be, because, yeah, if you say she's a puppeteer, but the thing about in narcissistic systems, they the enabler eventually also gets molded and they become that they, you know, you have the same, you know, it's they are them, they are a copy. He sees the world the way she sees the world. It's no, it's like in the church you have that same thing. It's there you've got the prophet, but everybody is only allowed to see things through a seer's eyes, and you're reinforced. And the longer you're in, you're brainwashed. My dad can't see. He sees me with my mom's eyes. And it's just like, we only, I only saw people outside of the church with the set of eyes that I had. I felt bad for the kids that I grew up with. I had on those eyes until I took them off, until, <laughs> you know, you're brainwashed. And all of my siblings, they, you can say in the church, yeah, I'm thinking for myself, but you aren't. You really aren't because you are redirected to the source. You are only allowed to read church-approved sources. And in my, mom, in my family, you're only allowed to listen to my mom. She knows everything. She was there. You listen to her and always redirected to the seer's point of view. And it's in the church. You can't think for yourself because you're not allowed to. And you, you, it's not, you wouldn't even, even if you wanted to, everything else is bad. You know, I, I wanted to have a relationship with my sister's kids and my sister's, you know, husband. But I, that was an outside source, and his narrative didn't fit my, my mom's narrative. And it was such a disconnect. It was so hard for me, and it was easier to either stay quiet or agree. And and you're only offered a couple of options. You stay quiet, or you agree, or you're loud, and you're kicked out. And that's what happened to me and my family. And yeah. Does that, that make like, sense? What was that like for you? It's so hard because, you know, I lost a sister. That this has been far worse because I miss them so much as much as I tried for 20 years I tried to prove to them I'm good I'm not who she says I am I'm good I'm a good sister I take my brothers on runs I'd have them at my house but the thing is even those have been tainted by her she has made me out to be, <laughs> I've heard things and, that I did that I didn't do. And I tried 
I tried so hard. I miss them. My kids miss their grandparents. They miss their, they miss their uncles. I miss all of them. It happens so fast. I mean, I'm just a year out. And, and I did end up seeing my dad a couple months ago on it because my, cause my oldest missed him so much and he invited him to a soccer game. Um, and I took the time off to go to that soccer game because I just wanted to. And I didn't know. He told me just as I was leaving. When it was out of town, it's it like a three, four hour drive. Yeah. So it was like far away. So, but he told me just as I was leaving that, uh, that they were invited. But I wanted to go, but they were just supposed to go the first half. And so, and I just thought, okay, I'll just miss the first half. And I was not even planning on seeing them but I walked right past my dad. And he didn't see me, but I walked right past my dad. I hadn't seen him in a year. And I missed him so much. It was like I had seen my older sister again. I hadn't seen her. It was like I called across to him. I said, Dad. Like That's all I said. I said, Dad. And he turned to me and he goes, we don't want any trouble. And um, and I said, what? I don't want any trouble. I'm here to watch my son play soccer. And he said, he said, um, he invited us. And, he said, and, and I said, okay. And then he, he, I said, can I talk to you? So I went and I walked toward him. And, and I said, the things mom said about me aren't true. You've been lied to. I said, you've been lied to. And he said, no, you're the liar. And he turned it on me and said that I, he said, I don't know what world you're living in. I'm like, what? And then I had a younger brother come from behind, and he was coming after me. This is in the parking lot. He was coming after me like he was going to hit me. Like an apologist, basically. Mm -hmm. He was going to hit me. And my dad had to, I had to tell him not to hit me. And my dad had to tell him not to hit me. Instead, he flipped me off. He was a return, he's a return missionary, newly returned mission, return missionary. And he called me a liar, said, no, you're the liar. And it was just like, they, and my mom just slid into the passenger seat of the car, sat there like this. She had built her army. They were going to defend her at all costs. At all costs. And all I had, I, my reality was distorted because they threw different things in there that weren't true, like half-truths and whatever. And I was just like, what are you saying? Like, I was trying to catch my ground. And it was so, so awful. And then my dad stood in front of his car and he said, we're done with you. And then he got in the car and they, he drove off. <laughs> So it's been really hard. And as I've learned about the church, that's what it is. It's one big narcissistic family. And, you know, learning about Joseph Smith, there is a lot of things there. And I just saw my mother. I saw my mother. <laughs> and I just could not be part of a system that covered up lies with goodness and then kicked people out who would talk, bring up the lies. I call it frosting on poop. <laughs> you just slather it with frosting. Look at all the good things, the love bombing. Look at all the good things we do. And, and don't look under, don't, you know, was it, who was it? Packer who said he didn't like historians. <laughs> or something like that. Oh, he said all, not all things that are true are useful. Yeah, something to the effect <laughs> of that. And it's like, no, you got to address the underbelly. And he said, oh, he said, he said historians have a problem. I think they have a, like an over-exaggerated affection for, for the truth or something like that. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm misquoting him, but that's the idea. Mm. 
It's an obsession with the truth, you know, an unhealthy <laughs> obsession yeah. with the truth. Yeah. But you have to address those things. You have to. You can't just cover it up. You can't. And it's not, it's not even necessarily about the abuse, like I said. It's about the lies. The church may do a lot of things in bad form <laughs> systematically, right? Like, you know, blacks in the priesthood, that's, a t that's awful, that's a terrible thing, and you can tie that to the times and all of those things. There's a lot of things, women's rights and all of those things that you can say, well, that's just the times and whatever like that. But if it's not what it says it is, no matter of policy change is going to fix that. You know, my parents can maybe look a little bit more nuanced and be really, you know, accepting of my husband, accepting of my children and look good and do all of these things. But no amount of frosting is going to hide the fact that it's, toxic and it's full of lies it's not real cake and if the church claims that it is the only way to heaven too you know all of that i don't know if that makes sense kind of does unfortunately kind of does yeah. it's sad it's sad but it does yeah and the church could do so many good things and my parents could do so many good things they have such good there's so much good in yeah. the church but you can't hold the people's families hostage based on goodness and you can't take people's money you know you can't do all of those things and say i don't know if it's not what it is then what is it <laughs> you know if it's not what it claims to be it has to be a fraud mm -hmm. yeah it's, Gordon B. Hinckley said it himself. Mm -hmm. It's either everything Joseph claimed it was or it's the greatest fraud ever perpetrated. Yeah. It's the greatest fraud ever perpetrated. Mm -hmm. and all the relationships and lives that have been damaged yeah. are done under the auspices of, of fraud. Yeah. There, I mean, progressive Mormons and believing Mormons hate that type of language. Mm -hmm. I, I posted on Facebook this weekend. I was trying to just gather some thoughts about Joseph Smith like 100, 100 challenges with Joseph Smith. And the very first one I wrote was the Book of Mormon was, was written by a known criminal. Mm -hmm. And like my Mormon brain is like, that's the worst thing you could ever say. How could you ever say that? Yeah. And it's absolutely factual. He, he broke the law. His treasure digging was a violation of the law. That's a fact. Now people were like, well, Martin Luther King Jr., you know, he was a criminal because he got thrown in jail for violating the Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Or Gandhi was a criminal because he violated the laws of India. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, I guess that's technically true, but different thing. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, they try to compare but, things. But that's gaslighting, right? Yeah. I mean, but the point mm -hmm. is, like, it's hard to say these words. Like, yeah. narcissism, narcissism is such a strong word. Mm -hmm. And fraud is such a strong word. And criminal yeah. and sexual predator... They're such awful, horrendous words. They are. And I don't like them. I don't yeah. like them at all. I don't either. I just mm. want to describe what happened. Yeah. What happened. Yeah. And that's why, like, when I talked to my dad, and, and I had a conversation mm. before the discard, I, I established a timeline. And I said, this happened, this happened, this happened. And because this happened, this happened. There's cause and effect. This wouldn't happen if this didn't happen. And he's like, oh, I didn't understand the timeline. Yes, understand the timeline. You know, and it's very important to establish a timeline. And that's what I loved about No Man Knows My History because it establishes a timeline and it establishes, you know, what happened at the time, what was going on and what other people were doing. And it wasn't unique to, to Mormonism, to to do these things that he was doing. It was a thing at the time, you know? And, and so, yeah, labels are really, really hard. But, 
you know, it's also, and I don't want to tangent too much, but just like critical thought has been, I like, I don't think I had a whole lot of critical thinking skills <laughs> before I started to deconstruct this, you know, and I remember reading in the beginnings of No Man Knows My History about Joseph Smith's childhood. And you know that story the, about him, you know, getting the cut out of his leg, you know, because, you know, when he had the, what, I don't know what it was, but he had to have a surgery in his leg. Mm -hmm. when the he infection, was, I think Yeah, the was. infection, that's what mm -hmm. it was. And I grew up with that story that he wouldn't, he was like eight or 10 years old around that age. Um, he wouldn't take alcohol. He wouldn't drink alcohol. And that glorified him as someone who wouldn't drink alcohol. He the words of wisdom, and he was so courageous and strong that he didn't need the, you know, antiseptic. Or, uh -huh. Is that the word? The, the, the anesthesia, 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 whatever it yeah. is. Mm -hmm. And I believed that yeah. so much. I was like, you know, he is, you know, he was wonderful from the beginning. But as I read Old oh, Man Knows My History, and it kind of talks about how he just was very, he was crying a lot. He didn't, he was kind of, you know, that it wasn't about rejecting anesthesia. It was about being kind of in a lot of pain, you know, just he, and I have an eight-year-old, we have an eight-year-old who has some dental work. And he, you know, age appropriate, he screamed like crazy. And we had to tie him down just to get a tooth taken out. And the doctor tried to give him Kool-Aid with some of that anesthesia in it just to numb it. He rejected the Kool-Aid. You know, it was very age appropriate. And I, when I read that, I was like, I have a son who re rejected Kool-Aid. I could go on and say, even my, my, my son even knew at a young age that Kool-Aid was bad for him, <laughs> you know? And he was, you know, very, no, it's age appropriate to be out of sorts when you're in pain at that age. Mm -hmm. And so when I read that, I was like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, he was also a human. And, <laughs> and that happened. And, 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 and that, and, and you know, and just reading about the, you know, the pages lost was also one of those things. 116 where, pages? Yeah, where you, you kind of throw who is her name now, Martin Harris's wife under Lucy. the bus. You, yeah, Lucy Harris, we were taught that she was Evil. just kind of bad. She was bad. She was thwarting the Lord's efforts. And when you start to think, oh, maybe she was actually quite a smart woman. You know, all of those things, I started to kind of think about it in humanistic terms and stuff. It was just kind of one of those. I, de I developed that part of my brain, and I'm very proud of it. <laughs> Critical thinking for the win. Yes. <laughs> Adam, is there anything you want to? I mean, you've you've sat very supportive and and uh, faithful in this interview. Yeah. Is there anything you want to share, just from your perspective, as kind of a witness to all this? Not necessarily to pile on the testimony, so to speak, but maybe how it's been for Ari, based on your witness but then how it's been for you to see her because because i'll just say this yeah. that when we studied lgbt suicide deaths by suicide um and, and when we researched what were the possible contributing factors to lgbt death by suicide we found out that family rejection was the number one contributor to death by suicide and you know ari you're not telling us you're lgbt but you're telling us you've been highly rejected by your family. Mm -hmm. So that can't be easy for you. And Adam, I'm guessing it hasn't been fun for you to watch. No, um, it's been very, it's, it's been difficult this uh, last year to see it. I mean, it's, it's an up and down, uh, you know, every day. Um, and um, it's hard because I can't, you feel like you can't control it do anything so you're trying to help but you don't know how to help um and from an offside perspective i just it was so weird or strange to see a family go from what it was to like all of a sudden just nothing 
And I'm thinking, how can a family just all of a sudden nothing in like a short amount of time cut off somebody for something like this? And like, I think of my kids, if, if this were something like similar, I'd do everything in my power to be trying to mend it or do whatever I could to be in part of their life. Um, and they're not doing anything. And they'll say it's because she's put these boundaries or cut them off. But that's not, there's not true. I don't, so it's like, I just, I don't know how to, to do that, but it, it's been hard. I wish, you know, only to support and help. It, it's just, I don't know how to do that. And, um, you know, how long would this go on? Will this ever, will this ever be a relationship again? We're thinking about our kids and, and that, and, and how will they, a future of, of, you know, with these, these, these family members, how will this be and how, how will we navigate that and, and everything? And um, so it's, it's just things you don't think about. And then you start to think about it and you're like, I don't know. It's just. Yeah, and it's interesting because I parallel draw the parallel to the church where it's like, what if they go back? What if they miss it and want to go back? The kids? Yeah, and then it's the same thing with my family. What if they go back? And I have to see that as a reality. What if they go back to these toxic, toxic systems? What if it's comfortable for them? What if they, and I, you know, you just can't control them, but it is a fear. It is a fear that they're going to be, again, if they go back to my family, are they going to be poisoned against me? If they go back to the church, are they going to be poisoned against? (laughs) You know, it's just going back into those things because when you go into those systems, you're in or you're out. And it's a big fear for me. So, but thankfully, we're doing okay right now. The kids, that's been a good yeah. story. Yeah, no, she's been very open and honest, and our kids are just, they know. They, they can see through the, the BS also, <laughs> I think, and I think our kids have level heads, and um, I think our oldest struggled the most because he, was, he had such a connection to her brothers. He was basically one of the brothers. I mean, he was so close in age. three years apart from my youngest. So it's been really hard for him, yeah. but I think even him seeing some of the, the things that have happened and being open and front and honest, and then also uh, he was very much in the church mm-hmm. and had signs up on the walls and everything and, you know, church related. And But now he's even just, we've let him do his thing and read and make his decision. I think it's the only best thing we could do, and, and yeah. she's just been open and honest. I think it's the best thing she can do for herself is just share it, be open and honest and yeah. and just not hide it. I didn't. And I, I didn't know what to do because I saw the damage it was causing and I didn't want it anymore. And I, but yeah, he was, I mean, he had, he had pictures and, and he was very in and that was a really hard thing to tell him that I didn't believe in this anymore. And I remember when I was standing, I was standing in the kitchen and my oldest son, and he, he looked at me like I was layman and Lemuel. He looked at me like, you're one of them now. You know, and I have had to earn that back. He, he just, I remember the look in his face as you're, you're one of them. And but he's been on his own path because I have been very, and he he likes Norse mythology, and he's we're Iceland, he's he's Icelandic, and and he's been reading some of those things, and he's like these stories have been told from the beginning of time. <laughs> he's like it's just they've been told, so that's been his road to deconstruct, and I've got a son who I would say is probably more on the atheist realm, where he likes science and he. Likes, and that's okay too. And I would never in a million years have thought that I would be okay with that. You know, our last Sunday, I got so angry at the, he was, he's 15 now, but he was 14 then. Because we, we went to church that, you know, one day, 
you know, after the pandemic and not after, but when things started to open up um, and he didn't want to go. And I guilted and shamed the crap out of him. I did. I said, well, why don't you want to go back to church? You should want to go back to church. We haven't been back to church for so long. And I was a terror that morning. I know I was. And um, I remember, we, well, we all went. We all went that day. And I, I remember walking into the church and just feeling dark because I just... I, didn't, I couldn't be there, yet I had forced my family to be here. And I knew what it took to get my family to be here, but I couldn't. I just I couldn't. And so I took the younger three across the street to the park, and I just cried. I sat there on the bench, and I cried and watched my children play. And I wanted my whole family there with me. I'm like, this is where we need to be. And the next week, I read the CES letter. <laughs> we never went back. Never went back. But it's been great. The kids are doing really well. There is a happy side to this story. So, yeah. Mm. Well, that's hard stuff. And uh, I will say um, we had some talks before doing this interview because for me, as important as I know this topic is, and as, as much as I, I am always looking for interesting, new, compelling stories, I'm never excited to do anything to contribute to the erosion of family ties or the breaking of family ties because we try to be on Mormon Stories all about mm -hmm. bringing families together, reuniting families. Mm -hmm. And so I was afraid, you'll know, yeah. and this was, I don't know, I was worried you were thinking this was condescending because I was worried for you that this might even further damage these relationships mm -hmm. but your reaction was kind of it was kind of jarring to me yeah so i'm trying to remember but i yeah i just i, mean, I said i'm worried you know that it'll, it'll make your relationship worse it can't get worse that's the thing i'm i'm dead to them they there's no as much as, I mean, I, I love to be the eternal optimist. I love to say, yeah, this is going to work out. But I confronted lies. This is like somebody who is excommunicated. I'm, my only way back is to totally forget everything and feed back into that, oh, every, you're wonderful, everything's great, and I'm so grateful for you, and you did everything right and nothing wrong. You gaslight yourself, yeah. basically. If I gaslit myself back into the system, I would be back in the system. The same thing with people who leave the church. If they pledge allegiance to the prophet, if they sustain and believe, and they're back in, they're welcomed back in. But I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to lie. And and it's sad. It's really sad. And my I don't have... It's been really hard to decide why I want to come here. It's not, I have everything to lose and more now again. Like, if they see this, I could be in danger. Like, I don't know what that means. And I don't know. You don't know. And uh, I'm not talking to them. I mean, this is not for them. This is not even for me. This has been hard. Like, I have a headache. <laughs> this is not for me. When I was in my darkest days, I, I wasn't going to survive this. And, and I had people throw me lifelines. And there were people said, read this watch this, listen to this, You're, you need to. And I, I did, and I'm here because people gave me a lifeline. And I guess I want somebody to, I want to be a lifeline to somebody, you know, and lessen the blow. Like, 
I was in free fall a year ago, in total free fall, with no, no end in sight except for an extremely hard landing that I wouldn't survive. And, and I'm, I'm so sorry if this makes my family, paints my family in a picture that is not if anybody sees this and knows my family. That's not my intent either. My intent is to help. My intent is to say this happens in Mormonism because you have to fit a mold. And it's an impossible mold to fit. And the only way in is to stay in, and the only way out is <laughs> you're not going to get out without a fight, without it's going to hurt. Like there's, this just is. There's no easy way out of this. <laughs> and I just want to be there for somebody who maybe might have experienced something similar. There's a book that comes to mind that Margie likes to recommend. She counts as one of her favorite books, just from her own personal life experiences. It's called Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents, How to Heal from Distant, Rejecting, or Self-Involved Parents. We're going to include that in the show notes. Are there any other resources that you have studied or have become aware of that might be useful to people? The book Educated by Sarah Westover. Tara? Tara. Oh, no, it's fine. Goodness, sorry. <laughs> yes, that was a lifeline to me because it was my life. Even down to the two brothers who, I have two brothers who, who will talk to me and who believed me. And um, I may not have lived in a mountain <laughs> um, like her as I see it for me. My, my mother was her, her, my mom was her dad, and my dad was her mom. Her mom was a healer, and they couldn't see doctors. My dad was a therapist, and we couldn't seek mental health. We couldn't seek mm. help. Um, it was, it paralleled my, it was, it helped me. That was me. Mm. We'll include... I also interviewed Tara twice on Mormon Stories, so we'll include those interviews in the show notes okay. as well. Um, there are probably other, may, maybe those who are uh, watching the live stream either on YouTube or on Facebook or who come after, you can make some posts of resources you recommend because there are probably some really good books and resources written about dealing okay. with narcissists, codependency, narcissistic parents, but we'll start with the, with the ones. Yeah, I wish I had more advice because I just, I, I didn't make it out very well. Well, <laughs> I was eventually just kind of tossed out. So any final words you want to offer to people who are in the situation just to kind of wrap things up a little bit? <sighs> Either of you, both of you, no. you want to go for No. You want to go first? Um, well, from an outside perspective, just be supportive as much as you can. Don't be judgmental. Just be supportive and let them. You can't. Can, you can't. You can help, but you you can't fix it. I don't know if that makes any sense. You just have to be there for them. So that's what I've been trying to do, and it's it's a it's a learning process. So, yeah. Just look for the lifelines. That's what I'd say. And, and know that it's not, you're not alone, and there's life after this. And I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm, and because it gets pretty dark, and just look for those lifelines. Try to find them. Can you name a few lifelines that have been important for you? Anything come to mind? Not to put you on the spot. Um. Those people you think aren't safe probably are. <laughs> you know, that's with me was look at the outsiders. You know, you may think that ex-Mormons are bad people. Generally speaking, I have not found that to be the case. Don't be afraid to talk to them. Look to the outsiders. 
and that's where you'll be you'll get caught they'll catch you and they'll help you land a little bit softer but then start to be yourself and try to rebuild who you are so. hmm. that's good wisdom because ultimately there's this idea of reparenting if you didn't get the parents you wanted or needed there are coaches or therapists that can help you learn to become your own parent, so to speak, and to break that dependency yeah. of their esteem and their affection and develop self-confidence in your own um, perception of yourself. To feel you're okay and you don't need mm -hmm. your parents' validation yeah. to feel like you're okay. Exactly, and that's I guess that's what I was wanting to say is more don't even, you need to look inward, look outward and inward. <laughs> I guess if I don't know if I made a lot of sense, yeah. but it was more trust yourself. Mm -hmm. That's what I've had to do because I don't want another guru telling me what I need to be doing. I, I need to trust myself. And so trust yourself that you can get out. And learn to identify the traits of unhealthy organizations or relationships. I'm thinking about Luna Lindsay Corbden's book, mm -hmm. Recovering Agency, mm -hmm. or the bite model with, with Stephen Hassan. But like, mm -hmm. there's a lot of parallels between narcissistic people and cults or unhealthy organizations. Mm -hmm. And if we don't learn the traits and the patterns, we'll just go from the frying pan yep. into the fire. If you can't ask questions, if you can't, if you're redirected to one source, then that's the problem. You can't criticize, mm -hmm. you know, if, mm -hmm. if there's only one way, if, yeah. if you have to conform to, to be loved. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, Ari and Adam, this is a really courageous and harrowing but inspiring story. So I can't, we can't thank you both enough for being willing to do it. Hope you're okay. Yeah, I'm okay. Just you have a vulnerability <laughs> hangover? <laughs> a little bit, but it's okay. It'll be okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Jen, any final words? No, I think the only one that keeps going through my mind, probably because I've seen the play like 10 times in the last two weeks, <laughs> is the um, Into the Woods, that musical. And it's in one of the songs, um, the girl says, nice is different than good and that's just kind of playing in my mind you know nice is different than good like look for good look for the good um whether you're deconstructing or where like i don't know in families where or like I don't know. In those families that look, you know, that are super nice, you know, I always hear that from people. Oh, they're so nice. They're so, they're so nice. You know, it, everything looks perfect. You know, nice, nice is different than good. And so, um, I don't know. <laughs> um, just maybe, maybe, I don't know. This is the other thing I always say, just pause, just pause and, um, take a minute to really see, um, really see the person that people are saying all those things about, mm -hmm. or maybe, you know, pause and maybe think about it from either their perspective or another angle, or maybe just pause mm -hmm. and look at, you know, that person in your family that is questioning or like in the or ex-Mormon or you know that layman and Lemuel in your family you know, maybe just pause for a minute and look for the good you know try and look at them the way Jesus would you know if you if you're in you know if you're believing um 
That's what I would say. Nice is different than good. And maybe just pause. Beautiful. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Thanks, Ari and Adam. Thank you for sharing something. I know it's going to help people. And I know it's not easy to do this, so thank you. You're welcome. I hope so. So thank you. Thanks, Jen. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for your support. Be kind to each other. Love each other. Let's all learn to do better and recognize harmful systems. And let's try and all improve our relationships one with another. And I say these things in the name <laughs> of Mormon stories. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. You all Thanks. take care. <laughs>